Great to hear from you and hopefully see you later on. I'm sure Steve will be uh, picking your brains as to hear your plans for the year ahead as well. We'll hear more from you and from Steve throughout the morning, who is ready to call the start of the women's race. We are indeed and a chilly, damp morning but one which is full of anticipation for both of our elite races as well as the masses, of course. Of course, back in 1981, the women would have started with everybody else, but now they probably have the loneliest race of the day. There, the names for you, Kiplagat Kitani, Mergia from Ethiopia, Florence Kiplagat, Priska Jeptu among the favourites, and then the British contingent there. Sonia Samuels comes here in pretty good shape. Emma Steptoe we've already spoken to this morning. Rebecca Robinson, of course, looking for perhaps World Championship and even Olympic qualifying times. Of course, Rio is so not that far Andy, away. Two hours, 19 minutes. The runner up here in so let's just introduce you to some of the top Ethiopia, names here. Aselevec Mergia won by just a second in Dubai back in January. Former bronze medalist at the World Championships. World record holder for the half marathon and the former world cross country champion has a great chance today. Florence Kiplagat. The New York champion of 2013, the London champion of 2013, representing Kenya, Priska Jetu. The Olympic silver medalist and won this race in 2013. Priska Jetu. Another who will be looking champion, to make it a second here win London, here. Representing Kenya, Edna Kiplagat. Defending champion and two times world marathon champion may yet still go to Beijing and the summer and says it may depend on how she performs runner, today. But here champion. is the favourite. The winner here, she's run twice in London, she's never lost. From Kenya, Mary Kitani. Mary Kitani. The second fastest on, marathon runner behind Paula Radcliffe and two-time winner of the London Marathon starts as the favourite. I said it's a bit of a lonely start for the elite women. And they have about a 50-minute head start on the main race this year. Not too many in there. There's also a championship race as well, which uh, many of uh, the rest of the best British athletes will be taking part in. But these are the women who have been chosen to contest the elite race. Just a minute or two away, watchers at the ready, many wearing gloves, arm warmers. It's a little chilly down at the start, but pretty good running conditions. It will warm up, they will warm up. And Joyce Smith gets the elite women's race underway and plenty of support down at the start. Easing away from the uh, start line, pacemakers in there to help them on the way. We've already spoken to Joe Pavey this morning. Joe will come in in a second, but it's a very, very good morning. Wouldn't be the London Marathon without Brendan Foster. Morning, Brendan. Good morning, Steve. And when you look down here and you listen to see Joyce Smith starting the race and you realize how far women's distance running has come since those days, 35 times this event has been run in the first London Marathon there were a four or five percent of the runners were women. Nowadays, there's about 40 percent. And it's these athletes here, including Paula Radcliffe, who we're going to see later, including Joe Pavey, who's sitting just along from us, and we're privileged to have Joe here with us today. These athletes, particularly these Kenyan athletes and the Ethiopian athletes, have led the inspiration forward. And what a great sight to see. The best women runners in the world, a field of champions here today, literally on their way, what's going to be an exciting, and a thrilling race from every point of view. Who's going to win it? Well, stay tuned, and we'll tell you in a couple of hours' time. Just before I bring uh, Joe in, we will be, of course, bringing you all of the action from both races uh, right throughout the morning. The men and the masses start at 10 past 10. Just one or two other names that uh, we didn't get the chance to introduce you to at the start. We've got plenty of time to. The likes of Jemima Sungong there, and just uh, we'll just pop back, Rob. Yes, thanks, Steve. The leading men about to go past one of the famous landmarks on the course. For those of you who've done London, it's always a nice marker when you get to Cutty Sark. You've knocked off about six and you're into your early race rhythm. So it's been quite interesting, Tanny, that uh, Dave has been covering all the moves. Marcel Hoog had a little go off the front. Josh George was setting the pace. It looks fairly steady now, but the last sort of five minutes when we've been watching the bike camera, it's been fairly uneven. 
and perhaps they're just trying to test each other here. They've not allowed each other to settle into any kind of rhythm. That's right, and it's uh, it's quite interesting because as you go through Cutty Sark, you notice the paving slabs are, are reasonably tricky to push over, and this is where you can kind of make a break. Oh, and there's just somebody's bumped into uh, the corner. It's a really tight turn coming round there, and a lot of these guys are racing with solid plastic gloves, which give a lot more consistency, but it makes turning and using the steering quite difficult, so you can't make sudden changes in your turning. Well, Tani, you were saying before the race began that there can be issues when they're going around the tight corners. And that's Pierre Fairbank from France. He's also um, a T53 athlete, so he has quite high level impairment, so he doesn't have the stomach muscles to, to control him. So if he starts going onto two wheels, it's, it's almost impossible for him to right himself back. Well, luckily he managed to right himself there. So we've got Hokanui leading. Dave Weir is in third place. Marcel Hoog is tracking him all the way. Very, very cagey here in these early stages. This is gearing up to be a really, really fascinating tactical race. Well, early stages in the elite women's race, and Joe's uh, back the comm box with us. Joe, I mean, we keep saying it's a nice day for running, and people thinking you must be crazy. It's freezing out there, and it's a bit damp, but it is actually pretty good conditions. The wind has dropped, and uh, it is cool, but it's good for marathon running. Yeah, it's definitely good for marathon running. They say anything between 10 and 12 degrees is ideal, and that's exactly what it is. There's not strong winds. Um, you know, it is a bit chilly at the start, but they'll certainly soon warm up, and yeah, it's ideal conditions. It's set up for a good race. A lot of pressure on um, the pacemakers. We've got these fantastic four, three or four others, are very, very good athletes. Uh, one or two from Ethiopia in there who will be fancying their chances. Sigai, you can just see in the blue, wearing a hat. And uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the British athletes as well. Sonia Samuels will be hoping for a good race. So there are different pacing groups, and the athletes have to make a choice, Joe, as to which group they want to be in. Um, they actually made the choice way back in January, which is what I always think is a bit odd, because you, yeah. you know, it's, it's April when you eventually ride here. Um, and then the final choices are sort of made on Friday. But yeah. the pacemaking is important these days at the beginning. Oh, definitely. I mean, people told me to the cows come home, get your pacing right, don't go off too enthusiastically when I did my first marathon, which was actually the London Marathon. However much people told me, I still went off too fast. It was such a good field, and I just got so excited and carried away with the occasion. And um, I learned my lesson um, the hard way. So when people ask for advice of me, I always say, get your pacing right. And these athletes will have really meticulously um, learned what pace they should try and aim for in their training. Well, just at the back of this, uh, looking at the back of the group, they're also pretty much together. We're talking about the British contingent. We've had a chat with them a step two, but Sonia Samuels has come into this in great shape. And Sonia, uh, Joe is somebody who is Emma. Um, but I think Sonia in particular looking to go as well under 2.30 as she possibly can today. It's a, it's a big opportunity. Yeah, I mean, for Sonia, she's been working at the sport for so many years, and I know her big dream is to make the Olympic team. Um, she became a full-time athlete to fulfil her ambitions and to try and aim for that goal. She's been out training in Kenya really hard, and I know she has said her preparations have gone really well, and um, she's really hopeful for a good race. I know last year she took um, time away from the marathon, focusing on getting her speed better over 5 and 10K, really with this big aim in mind, and I really hope she has a good run today. Well, right, tucked over on the far side, Edna Kiplagat wearing a hat, wearing the uh, purple. And, uh, well, Edna's a, a really interesting character. Two-time world champion winner last year. And uh, she does travel around a little bit, but thankfully her husband goes everywhere with her because he is a coach. And she was telling me the other day about the influence of her husband. Yeah, they've uh, spent a fair bit of time in, in the States, in, in uh, the likes of Boulder, and Edna was telling me how she felt as though well. Her husband has picked up a lot of things that uh, some of the other Kenyan coaches, if you like, wouldn't have done, particularly things like nutrition. She said she felt as that's made a big difference. The thing I like about Edna Brendan is she's a she's a great racer. You know, she came onto the scene in 2011 in the Worlds in Daegu when didn't know too much about her, and she's she's done a really good job of when it really matters. If she's in shape, she races really well. She certainly does. I mean, twice world champion, you can't knock that. And the Olympic Games, I'm sure, will feature in our plans. But if you look at the 
dilemma these Kenyan athletes have, the men and the women these days, to get into the Kenyan team, you've got to be at your very best for the selection, which makes it really difficult to keep that going and then qualify and run in the Olympic Games. But Edna Kibler got last year's champion, a much a favorite this year, just settling down in the middle of the group, looking around, just keeping aware of what's going on. You can sense that one or two of the athletes closer to the front are trying to encourage the pacemakers because that opening mile of around about 5 minutes and 38 seconds was a pretty slow opening. Um, and you could see because of the size of the group as well that the pacemakers haven't clearly got into their rhythm yet. But there, Edna Kipler got the purple vest and the yellow armbands. I'm going to ask Joe about the armbands. Joe, do you wear them? No, I remember one time when I ran in um, New York, I think it was in the half marathon, everyone had the armbands and I didn't. I thought I'm definitely missing something here and uh, it's something I should maybe try. I mean, they are handy because obviously, unlike wearing a long sleeve top, if you feel the need, you can take them off very easily during the race. But um, Edna would have looked into everything and, um, you know, it's great to see her out running well. Her and her husband Gilbert, as you were talking about, they're the most friendliest couple ever and they always come up and talk to you when you're at race meetings and, you know, her being double world champion and last year's champion, it's great to see her out here running. Have you got some now, Joe? I've got some, but I still haven't worn them. No, it's just, um, I think I get set in my ways. Um, one time I was racing in Italy and it was freezing and everyone had long sleeve and I was just in my normal race strip and um, the the person commenting over the loudspeaker actually said, and here's Jo Pavey in her bikini, but, which wasn't actually the case, but um, everyone else does seem to wrap up more appropriately than me in races, I think. Simon Lawson leading with Dave Weir alongside him. Good push this from Simon. Competes for Carlisle Tri Club. As Dave Weir now heads to the front. But it's fairly tight here. Every time somebody goes to the front, whether it's Lawson or Josh George, Dave Weir is there to cover the break. And Marcel Hoog is always right behind Great Britain's hope. Dave Weir, of course, trying to become the most successful wheelchair racer in London marathon history. Hey guys, thank you. Well, thanks, Gabby. Just a couple of moments ago, the leading contenders in the men's wheelchair race were greeted with huge applause on both sides of Tower Bridge, just shy of the halfway point. And it's a moment that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand to attention, however quickly or slowly you're getting there. Dave Weir still covering all the moves at the front. But as we get into the second half of the race, that is where things will start to get very interesting indeed. Another couple of hours, this will be absolutely solid with runners of all abilities in all costumes, but it's single file for the leading wheelchair contenders. Tani, if you were Dave at the moment, are you quite happy with how this is unfolding? If I was Dave, I think I'd be very happy. Britain Simon Lawson led the race for about three miles, kept very even paced, um, which suited Simon as well as Dave. But with Josh making uh, a few kicks, it, it kind of throws up a few interesting points. But Dave's always at the front. Um, you know, uh, Ernst van Dijk is, is, is looking OK, but at the moment, Dave's in the best position he could possibly be in. Well, at the front of the women's race, uh, there's been a little bit of... Uh nibbling away at the pace mary katani has uh, got the pack moving along behind the pacemakers they have picked up just a minute or two ago florence kiplagat over on the far side who's had her hair dyed a nice shade of red uh also just had a little look at the field said come on let's try and get this moving along a little bit so they have picked it up but it's a very circumspect start the first 5k they were running at around 222 and a half pace which is a fair bit slower than we were expecting. But the first mile in particular, I think, as Brendan said earlier on, uh, was, was very slow. It's in prospect there, as we said this morning. And it's been warming up, Joe. We've been watching it. One or two, uh, we said, uh, one or two kind of pushing on. It's interesting that they're not with the pacemakers, though. And the pacemakers are, are, are about 30 metres ahead. And you can just see them disappearing out of the picture as they go around Kuti Sarke. Now, Mergia, the Ethiopian who won in Dubai, she'd made a little bit of a break, but they quickly reeled her back in. 
Yeah, it looked like she was going to push on there for a while. It's interesting, they haven't quite gone with the pacemakers, but they're all watching each other. But it looked like Merger was going to make a break. She must be keen to finally get a London title. I know that um, in 2010, she's thought to be the winner because the two Russian athletes ahead of her um, since failed um, doping tests. Um, so she's going to be out there trying to get a win as of right in May soon be awarded the 2010 title depending on how things go but she's definitely running keen out there and Mara Katani looks very comfortable at the moment. Well from a British perspective as well we've got uh, we just saw Sonia Samuels there who's just gone through 10k Sonia's gone through in 35 minutes and one second which is uh, I think pretty much on schedule for her she's uh, going to be helping see Susan Partridge wearing pace four Susan one of our best um, distance runners, one of our better marathon runners as well. Emma stepped to rather on her own though. She's uh, away from that sort of group and is going to be ploughing a lone furrow for most of this race. That is one of the problems for the elite women. If For the British women, I think, Joe, if you decide to go in the elite race, you're going to be on your own for a, a long, long way if you're running outside 2.30. Yeah, I mean, Emma Stepto is just doing so well. She came to running at an older age. Um, she's from the West Country, from Cornwall, like me. And, you know, it's interesting listening to her earlier. She's really excited about the whole occasion and just hope she gets up there and enjoys it and has a really good run. Well, Brenda, uh, the thing that you were talking about, about them looking at each other, I, I think there's a bit of this going on in the women's race as well. The pace is solid not as quick as we were expecting and we're already sort of six miles in and it's it, you know they're looking at each other rather than thinking about the clock well it is a race you've got some great athletes there you've got the champions there we started the conversation about a field of champions well they're exactly where you want to be mary katani former winner here is well on her way looking good and being happy at the front So the women's elite race still yet to really get going. Don't forget you'll be able to follow uninterrupted coverage of the women's and the wheelchair races live on the red button and, on, on, and online via the BBC Sport website. For the meantime, though, we're going to be leaving you on BBC Two. We'll be back on BBC One in just a moment. You're watching us on BBC Two. This is the leading group from the men's wheelchair race. They have around seven miles or so to the finish. We'll be with them shortly live here on BBC One. And this is the elite women's leaders. They're around the eight mile mark and the race is a classic. It looks set to be a battle between four fantastic athletes. Edna Kiplagat, Florence Kiplagat, Priska Jeptu and Mary Katani. But they're all there. We'll see them live here on BBC One shortly. You can watch that race on the red button or on the BBC Sport website. But for the moment, we're building up to the elite men's race and the mass start, which is about seven minutes away. Well, what a race in prospect. Well, Gabby heading off to the finish, and these men will be hoping that uh, one of them will be the person that she will be interviewing as the winner. Wilson Kipsang, the winner from last year, former world record holder. Dennis Kimeto, the new world record holder. Emmanuel Mutai, the second fastest of all time and former winner here. Champions galore, so many names to look out for. Elliot Kipchoge will run well here. Stanley B. Watt as well. Scott Overall, the best of the British athletes. Mike Shelley. The Commonwealth champion, what a great race he had in Glasgow last summer, seems so long ago now. Matt Hines' his debut in the marathon here. So lots of interest right through the different levels of the elite men's race. Well, Dick Beardsley and Inga Simonson who finished hand in hand. 35, well it was there, 1981 wasn't it? This is the 35th running of the end. There's the two of them there with Joyce Smith. Joyce set the elite women underway. And uh, it's great to see the guys here. They're both looking very, very well indeed, I have to say that. And there have been some incredible races over the years, but I'm not sure we've ever had this sort of lineup. This is Stanley B. Watt. He's the third fastest on the course here at London. A bit of a surprise man getting into the top three last year when he finished second behind Wilson Kipsang. At 18 years of age, this man won the World Championships at 5,000 metres on the track. We thought that's where he'd be at his best. He is now one of the world's best marathon runners, Elliot Kipchoge. Talking about young talent at just 19, he ran 2.4.32, a world junior best for the marathon in his first ever marathon, Sigai Mekanen of Ethiopia. Seven times the starter here, seven times in 
Past winners love coming back to London. Emmanuel Mutai won in 2011. And in Berlin last year, he followed Dennis Kometo home to record the second fastest ever marathon time. This is the man who won on the day. He only knows how to run fast marathons. He says he's still learning the event. He is the world record holder, Dennis Kometo. Winner last year. This could be the third time he wins the London Marathon. Two-time winner before, of course, and as I said earlier, the former world record holder, Wilson Kipsang. Always smiling. Will he be smiling at the end? So the elite men get the privilege of a clear start. For everybody else, they'll be in the throng. This could be London's greatest ever race. The two former champions get ready to set us on our way. The 2015 London Marathon gets underway. Will it be the best ever? Only time will tell. And there they go. A true festival of running as ever. This race has no match in the world. The world's best invited to line up along with the masses who are united in their own quest to finish. And of course today, a very special guest, an old friend if you like, and she'll be out there with everybody else. Maybe a chance to say hello to many and to wave goodbye as well. An emotional day for Paula Radcliffe, I'm sure. And like everybody else here, she will still be trying to do the best that she can on what should be a very, very special day for the London Marathon. A wonderful scene there. Inga Christensen and Dick Beersley who finished the first London Marathon with a hand of friendship. That immortal line from David Coleman, who incidentally his family over here are, are watching all together today. It would have been David's 89th birthday today. And his line, a hand of friendship, has extended over those, these many years. It's going to get out of there, she's going to be rammed in there, but uh, she'll be, uh, like the rest of us, watching what's going on all day and we, of course we've got all sorts of technology to help you uh, through the morning and into the afternoon the elite men of course just on their way and they will join the rest of the masses all the three different starts come together at about three and a half miles uh, so they're just about a mile and a half almost two miles in but the elite women not too far away actually from tower bridge and then across tower bridge which is just around the halfway point uh, the wheelchair athletes are absolutely flying round. Drop. Yes, they certainly are, Steve. Thanks very much. But the biggest piece of news here is that we're looking at a lead pack of seven, but Marcel Hood, who beat Dave Weir in a sprint finish last year, is not among that group. And here's the reason why. Tanny Gray Thompson was talking about the fact that the wet conditions can lead to punctures. There's Hood looking down. He's got the silver helmet on, he's in third place there. This is earlier on. And this was the reason why Marcel Hu suddenly found himself way off the pace. Now it's not 100% clear whether he's pulled out of the race or whether he's back in it and trying to play catch up. If he is still in the race, and Tani had a text message to say he was about nine minutes off the pace. If he is still in the race, then he has a huge, huge margin to make up and it will be far too much to get back on track with the likes of Dave Weir so that's a real shame for Marcel Hoog and it's changed the dynamic of how this race is being played out Dave Weir will certainly be aware Tanny that one of his great rivals is not in that group it's a real shame from a neutral's perspective but presumably from from Dave Weir's point of view trying to win seven London Marathon titles it's, it's one fewer opponent to worry about. You're right, it's completely changed the dynamic of the race and you could see that you know, Simon Lawson came to the front, put some kicks in, was really trying to close the, you know, make the gap as big as possible because if you get a puncture um, Ernst van Dijk has apparently been able to fix a tyre in three and a half minutes but you can't make up that kind of gap and pretty much for the whole race David Weir has been sitting in the second position um, there's lots of different guys who've come to the front. Josh George has been setting a lot of the pace, but Dave's just looking. And 
The way Dave sits in his chair, when he drops his head, he can actually see under his chair to see who's behind him as well as looking over his shoulder because he wants to make sure he's got as much of the road covered as possible, that if anybody kicks, then, then he can cover it. Well, the story in the elite women's race is that perhaps the quality of this field has meant that we've got, we do have a real race on our hands, but it's not a fast one. They've allowed the pace to really drift, and actually the previous mile, 5.44, Joe, that is very, very slow. So they are, they are operating at a much slower pace than we imagined. They're not really attaching onto the pacemakers. In fact, some of the, I hesitate to call them lesser athletes, are only 50, 60 metres behind this group. But it, it, it's a bit of cat and mouse at the moment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that 544 miles um, just shows how much the pace has slowed. I suppose, like you're saying, that can be the danger when there's so many top-class athletes there together. They all want to win this race. No one wants to do the work. And, um, you know, it's probably fair to say that Mary Katoni, um, at the start of her marathon career, was one to really go for it and um, actually paid the price on one occasion, particularly in New York in 2011. She went through in such a fast pace, but then died of death at the end. And now she's started to become more of a racer. But they all want to win this race, and that's the danger when there's so many good people out there. And it will eventually become an exciting race. But let's hope they pick the pace up a little bit. Well, I think the steady opening half is what Mary Katani wanted. She's a bit nervous about going too fast for the first half. The athletes are in just completed 11 miles. They're approaching the halfway point and there's still safety in numbers and when you look at a quality field like this the temptation to go running off on your own trying to run a fast time or trying to beat a record is is really difficult whilst the women are here approaching the 12 mile point back in the start the real london marathon is well underway well it takes a good 10, 12 minutes or so at least for many of these to even get running and you know we all have friends who are running and uh, actually Chris Evans is out there who announced uh, just last night that he was going to take part actually had a get the hotel and uh, was soaking up the atmosphere on Friday had a bit of a lunch with Paula and um, trying to ask for last minute advice which everybody does and the usual thing is start slowly say the same thing to everybody and enjoy these first uh, or the first couple of kilometers where you can just ease yourself into the and the atmosphere all of the days and months of training you can get carried away at the beginning but I think so many people have I hope have listened to the advice over the years know what to do in the early stages Lots of clothing will have been discarded and it's all collected up and given to charity afterwards because uh, they give their baggage, or they put the baggage on the buses a little while ago, so they will have all kept warm, I hope, anyway, by keeping some articles of clothing. I can see quite a lot of people even starting still wearing tracksuit tops and probably get rid of them once they get going a little bit. But it is warming up, I think, I think the sun is coming out where we are. While the journey is beginning for many, for the elite wheelchair racers, they are beginning to think about the big finish. Thomas Hamelak, he's been around a long time, the Polish athlete leads. Josh George has shared duties as far as the pacemaking is concerned. And from a British perspective, Dave Weir is tucked in in third place. He's covered every move so far. He's had a, a minute or two, but no more than that, at the front on his own. But he is poised and ready. Remember, he beat Marcel Hoog, who is recovering from a puncture and is out of contention at the front of the race. He beat Hoog in a sprint finish in Lisbon a month ago. And Tani, he said during the week when I spoke to him, I'm feeling sharp, I'm feeling ready. Is that how you read his body language as we get up towards the climax? David Weir is looking very comfortable at the moment. The mile pace has slowed slightly in the last mile. You can see when Hamalak's pushing, he's just pausing at the bottom of the rim. Um, and Dave's sitting up, he's breathing, you know, he's, he's looking incredibly relaxed at the moment. Um, he, he tends to just stay slightly out of the draft, because Josh George, who's in second place, is a good sprinter, but 
if Hamalak goes at the front, Weir needs to be able to get out quickly. The chairs are you know, two and a half metres long. You need to make up a big gap. It's much further to get round the pack than, than running. So Dave Weir at the moment is, is looking good. But some good sprinters behind, and you can't write off Vince Van Dyke in this position either. Van Dyke in the familiar rainbow colours of South Africa. Absolutely enormous shoulders. But Weir poised and ready, waiting to strike here. A wonderful finish in prospect. Not the duel we were expecting with Marcel Hoog. But Dave Weir ready for a big finish here. And he will be put to the test by the likes of Van Dyke. And you can just see them in the distance. For the club runners and the fun runners, it indicates around about a mile and a half to go. And it's a wonderful sight when you see Big Ben in the distance. But these guys will be focused trying to work out when the break will come. And Tani, do you think Dave would leave it right until the mile, or, or would he be feeling good enough to try and go earlier than that and deny the likes of Van Dyke an opportunity in the last 150 metres? David Weir tends to leave it till he comes round the final bends and he has the finish in his sights. But, you know, last year, actually, the guys were waiting for him to do that. So, you know, that's when uh, Marcel Hoog went early. Um, so if I were Dave right now, I'd, I'd be trying to wind it up a little bit before the finish and take some of the sting out of the tail. You know, Pierre Fairbanks has been sitting at the back, hasn't come to the front lot, is quite fresh. Josh George, you know, is, is maybe not in the sprint shape at the moment because he's been pulling an awful lot at the front of the pack. But I think right now, David has to kind of throw a few little surprises in. Um, you know, Van Dyke at the front, pushing well, but, but they're trying to save energy at the moment. They will all be looking for when Dave goes, and if he goes first, that's how he's going to win. Well, single file as they head round. Van Dyke leading Josh George in second. Dave Weir is in third place. Remember, he's been in this position six times before and been victorious. Seven victories in London would make him the most successful wheelchair racer in the 35-year history of the London Marathon. And Tani, I know you'll be quite happy to relinquish that record. Every great milestone has to be beaten at some stage. You know, I've known Dave Weir since he was seven years old, so actually to see where he's come, it would be amazing if he could do it this year. Well, the elite women are now on the upper section of the Tower Bridge, and it has really been an interesting race to watch, but not one which has uh, really got going yet. And uh, you just feel as though somebody is just waiting here. They're still operating around 2.21 pace, something like that, but the pace has been up and down. We've had a 5.44, a 5.41. We have had a couple of quicker miles earlier on, uh, but they're still not really pushing the pace here. The previous mile that they've just gone through, the 12th mile was 5.37. So, at the moment, this big clash of the big names, Edna Kiplagat, Florence Kiplagat. So now the big drive for the finish is on. Van Dijk is leading. Josh George is still in the mix. The two Japanese athletes, Soejima and Hokinui, cannot be discounted. Hamalak, with the zigzag white stripe on his black helmet, is still in there. And Dave Weir, second right of picture. He has that distinctive Union Jack helmet. Is he finally going to make it a magnificent seven here on the streets of the city he calls home and the streets of the city where he became a Paralympic legend with four gold medals? You could just wait and see him from the start. Dave's picked up his pace a little bit going into the turn. That final right turn is, is pretty hard because it's a slight climb and it takes a bit of the pace out of you. But Dave is just edging to the front. He's just looking left and right. He's looking underneath to see where he is. And right now he's in a great place. Dave, we're leading. Fairbank having a brilliant push in second place. The Frenchman tried to come up on Dave's inside. Dave, we're driving round the final corner. He can see the finish. He can sense the glory. Josh George is coming. Hamalak's trying to mount a charge on the outside. It's Josh George who's closing down on Dave Weir. Come on, Dave. Let's put those fingertips to the test. It's going to be mighty, mighty close on the line. Is George going to deny Dave Weir? Oh, my goodness, yes, he is. 
It was weird for the taking. We were talking about Marcel Hoog as being the potential party spoiler before the race began. And Joshua George has had the finish of his life. A great race by Dave Weir, absolutely superb, put himself in exactly the right position, but Joshua George has just produced the biggest moment of his career by some margin. Wow. Well, it was, there was tenths of a second in it. Hockenui's got a problem here. Hockenui's tyres just come off in the final sprint fairs. I can't believe that. Wow, that, that what was happened there? Um, Weir was just in an amazing position. I have never seen George come up so close like that. And it almost looked in the last two pushes like Dave just stopped pushing, that he didn't quite go through the line. Um, it looked like Ernst had a, a bit of a, a tumble into the bollards as well. But, but you look there, absolutely stunning pushing from the guys. Um, best race of uh, Josh George's life. Josh George on the right-hand side. Hokanui had a real tumble there. I think he may have had a problem with Hamalak and Van Dyke got in amongst that as well. You can see the three guys coming across the finish line. Dave Weir, a great sport. Second place last year. Second place this year. But after a wonderful winter and a great win in Lisbon, I'm not sure he can quite believe that. And to be honest, these guys race so often together, I'm not sure any of them, apart from Josh George, would have been expecting that he had that turn of speed at the end of a race. It was so, so tight. But all credit to George, he fully deserved a win. Well, there's always somebody who sleeps in. Your own personal start. Where you go. Excellent. Now get a move on and hurry up. You've got a lot of people to catch, about 38,000 or so. See how many you can get past. We'll find out how 12.055 is getting on a little later on. Now, talking about uh, not being... Uh, or be <laughs> The opposite of being a little bit late at the start, the men, the elite men, have set off at a cracking pace. They're about uh, heading into their fifth mile now, but they went through the first five kilometres actually in world record pace. 14.31, the pacemaker took them through. All of uh, the main group that we'd expect to be there all tucked in, including the likes of Sigai and Mekinen, the two Ethiopians who uh, should be... Uh, ones we should watch out for as well, but uh, Kipchoge, quite a few of them wearing a hat. Uh, I can see Jeffrey Mutai got a hat on. I'm pretty sure with this hot pace, though, it won't be long before he discards that because they are moving at a real pace. Kipchoge, right in the front there, I can see Emmanuel Mutai over on the right-hand side. Kipsang just happy to be further back in the pack there. B Watt is there also. And uh, Kimeto right at the back, the world record holder, thinking, hang on guys, I've been here before, I know what this pace is like. But Brent, I mean, your world record pace early on, there are a couple of fast miles in there, but this just needs to settle down a little bit. Well, the men's race, the leading protagonists have followed the pacemaker, and the pacemakers are doing the job. They're moving it along, they're amongst them, the athletes that we've expected, the world record holder, Kimeto is there at the back, Kip Sang's there, Elliot Kipchoge, the athlete with a fine pedigree, on the track, right in the middle in the blue vest. Elliot Kipchoge, he's an athlete to watch out for. Stanley Biewart in the yellow and the orange vest on the outside. So the men are moving it along. Emmanuel Mutai, the training partner of Elliot Kipchoge. McConnon on the outside of Ethiopia. Sege of Ethiopia too. So they're all there, head down. The race has started. They've been running 25 minutes. And this is getting serious already. Joe in the uh, women's race, Mergia, uh, while we were away, had another little kind of push at the front. But again, the pack of uh, very quickly closed back in on her. Yeah, she keeps pushing the pace, and you, you think she's going to just make a break for it, and then she settles back in again. I think she wants the pace to be faster, but then she um, goes back again. But, but yeah, I mean, it could be that at some point that they will suddenly surge and the pace will take off, but they're all up there at the moment, the ones you expect to be there. 
Well, they went through in 71-39, uh, slower than expected, but pretty much on schedule. Sonia Samuels running with Mary Davis from, uh, United, um, from New Zealand. Uh, was on good schedule, 74-37 at halfway. She's wanting to run sub-230, so that's a good first half, Joe. Sets yeah. herself up really nicely, and uh, if she can run slightly negative splits, she's on for a good time. Yeah, she's really on schedule, and she looks good. She looks in control, and her face looks just so focused. And, you know, I've seen Sonia run a lot of times, and she does look so relaxed here, and I really hope she has a good run. She's really going for it. So good so far for Britain's number one today. Of course, somewhere out there is that, uh, should we call her the former number one, Paula Radcliffe. That's not her, by the way. Uh, she does have Paula on the front, in case you don't know what she looks like. Um, but, patiently waiting. Still in Greenwich Park as they come through the gates of the Red Start. Not quite there yet. Not far though, that's the back. And they've only got about, about 150 metres to go. One or two people running off in the wrong direction completely. That's because the toilets are down there. You have to wait so long sometimes on the start line and you're hemmed in, in, in all respects. So sometimes when the, when the release comes, the first thing they look for is somewhere to go at the loo. Well, we'll talk about the event, Steve. <laughs> and there they go, come Greenwich Park, turning out. There's the blue start, almost empty. The race well underway there from that point of view, but they're coming out of Greenwich Park, they're turning left, they all come through the timing mats, chip timing is available today, and they'll all be getting their own individual times monitored on route, the five, five or six measuring po points, so these know exactly what's happening, they don't have to worry, it'll all be taken care of, and there's the course. Well, the three starts that we've mentioned, Brent talking about the blue start there, the blue and the green start merged together after about a mile and a half. The red start, the mass start, finally joins them on the downhill section at about uh, four miles or so. Then they twist and turn towards past Charlton there, uh, towards Cuddy Sark, of course, one of the iconic features of the route. And then cutting through rather high 10-mile point, along the river then they can start to see the shard certainly a new s site on the uh, london skyline cross tower bridge that's when halfway comes then they're into canary wharf area around the isle of dogs lots more people supporting these days in that area then they head back towards the tower bridge area they can see each other see their friends go in the opposite direction then onto the embankment as they turn they can see big ben in the distance they know they're near the end Birdcage Wharf, Buckingham Palace, and into the mile for the finish line. Hasn't changed much over the years. There's been one or two changes to roadworks this year, very minor ones. Uh, around, I think 2005, the last time, there was a bit of a major change when we got rid of the cobbles on the, on the tower, and these athletes will be pleased about that. It's quicker course now, and uh, I wonder how quick we're going to see these men go today. Well, they're setting up as though they're going to go quick. Enough of them are going quick. A leading group. Interestingly, Kip Sang, the champion, moves a little bit closer, looking around for his training partner, the world record holder. And here's the leading British athlete. It's Scott Overall, number 17 in the red vest. He says he's aiming to run about 211, 212. If he can, that would put him in a great position to say to the selectors, there's my time, there's my performance. And right alongside him is Michael Shelley, the Commonwealth Games Marathon Champion of Australia, number 18. So he's in good company, is Scott Overall, running strongly there, looking good. Yeah, it's good to see Scott have a good run today. Well, it's going to be an American double as far as the two elite wheelchair titles are concerned. Josh George has picked Dave Weir to the men's title and Tatiana McFadden is coming home for a hat-trick of London victories. And of course, as this doubles up as a world championship, it's yet another global title for a woman who is almost proving unbeatable as far as the marathon is concerned. She hasn't relinquished the title over the marathon since 2012, 141.13. Another massive course record for Tatiana McFadden. There was, of course, the potential 
that Manuela Shaw, the defending world champion, would put her under pressure. But Tani, Tatiana has got to be the greatest female wheelchair racer in history, surely. She's been incredible. I mean, just the confidence that she's had in the last two seasons. She always used to sit around and watch and, and wait for other people. But, you know, that's an emphatic win, especially coming off a, a really tough Boston Marathon to come in and, and to break the women's pack very early. Just nobody could stay with her. An amazing story for Tatiana McFadden. Another chapter in a glittering career. Russian by birth. Adopted by her mum, who was working over in Russia, and the rest, as they say, has turned into Paralympic and athletic and marathon history. So the elite men are getting to the area with a huge crowd. So this whole area around in uh, Greenwich and around Cutty Sark. One of the most popular places to watch because if you're clever you can watch here and then either on the uh, dlr or through the pedestrian tunnel get back into the isle of dogs and watch them again around the 16 17 mile mark good close-up shot there steve that black and white shirt is shaftsbury harrier's shirt just in case you were a bit nervous you thought it was a new cast united well they're doing a bit better than the uh, black and white at the moment but i can't say much kind of as, as a red and white Let's keep football for another day, shall we, the pair of us, because we've got nothing to shout about. Exactly right. Joe, do you have a football team? Um, well, I'm a real fan of Exeter City, obviously, they're my home team. Of course team. you are. Yeah. And didn't so they play at St James's Park? Pardon? Isn't that right? Didn't yeah. Exeter City play at St James's Park? Yeah, unfortunately they didn't win, but it was just exciting. You know, <laughs> um, but they're a brilliant team, you know, up and coming youngsters in the team as well, and, you know, wish them all the luck. Check you with your knowledge. <laughs> Checking the watch. Pacemakers have got a real tough job to do, as I said, because the men have asked for a quick pace here. Edwin Kipiego and Wilfred Mogo with a job here of almost keeping these guys together and keeping them in check. A very, very fast opening first 5K, and then it's starting to settle down a little bit, which uh, is probably wise. We've seen the pacemaking go a little awry uh, on one or two occasions in recent times. Hopefully not this time, but they went through in 29.14 through 10k, Brendan. There's many people who would be delighted to have that as a personal best on the roads for 10 kilometers, and that's still 2-3 pace for the marathon. Well, they really are doing the business here. The women's race is a bit cagey. The athletes are watching each other. The men are watching each other, but the pace they're going at, it, there's no time for that. There's more time. There's Scott Overall running strongly. And just ahead of him, Michael Shelley, and Raymakers of Holland, so the three of them together, that's a good position for, for him to be in. He's got some good company, they're good athletes. The Commonwealth champion number 18 in the Red Best. We saw him win that magnificent race, a brilliantly judged race when he won the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow last summer. Brought the streets of Glasgow to a halt with his performance. O Australia's only track and field medal in those Commonwealth Games. And as we go ahead, we watch how far they are behind. There'll be another group down the road before we get to the lead group. But you can see that gap. Well, I think in this group, the likes of uh, Sergei Lebed, great name, but uh, for particularly for cross-country fans, nine-time, I think, European cross-country champion. And uh, this a group which uh, are operating at a sub-210 pace here. It's got overall running at around 211, just inside 211 pace in the early miles, which is good for him, setting himself up nicely. Uh, some of Europe's best uh, obviously like Scott overall be people the uh, Olympic qualifying window uh, is open if you like has been uh, for a few months already this year so athletes already with a view to qualifying for Rio if not for Beijing of course Beijing World Championships in the summer I'm not sure that's as much of a target for many athletes because conditions will be tough they will be tough in Rio of course but the Olympics is always a bigger draw than the World Championships. So, big gaps appearing, but that lead group, no wonder, because they are going so fast. And all of the contenders, which we mentioned are right at the very beginning, seem to be in that lead group. Nobody has decided to sit back a little bit, and that would be a really risky thing to do. You can't really afford to do that with the quality in this field. There, the big guns are 
gathered together the world record holder last year's champion there number one in the white vest and that group following the pacemakers watching each other running strongly running quickly and whilst they, those guys 36 minutes of running back there's Paula Radcliffe enjoying the crowd support enjoying the company she's never had much company before in the London Marathon she's usually been out on her own but there's Paula looking good well, yeah she's got enough, a smile on her face look Joe just to say I've just looked at her split she went through 10k in 35 23 which is only a couple of seconds slower than Emma Stepp, who went through 10k yeah. uh, who's in the elite race <laughs> but, yeah uh, she's running fairly quickly but she does have a smile on her face yeah she does and, Funny enough, there's a few people helping her on her way. Yeah, I bet a lot of runners around her just can't believe they're actually getting to run with Paula Radcliffe. But I really hope Paula can enjoy this moment. She's had such an amazing career. She's been a great ambassador for distance running. And she really deserves this 26.2 mile big goodbye. Um, she's just been a wonderful runner, wonderful ambassador. And it's great to see her out there, able to actually enjoy her race. Well, I said to her yesterday, I said, you know how you used to count the lampposts, which she did. That's how she used to kind of keep her rhythm. I said, how about looking at the faces in between the lampposts this time and you're know, trying to maybe do a few high fives. And I think she is doing that. Look at the smile on yeah. her face. She's it's absolutely great, loving this. Yeah, it's so great to see. She's really enjoying it. And that's what she should do. She deserves this. She deserves all the applause of the crowds. And it's just fantastic. She was emotional even before she started. Just think how emotional she's going to be at the end. And I'm so, so glad that she's able to enjoy this. It's brilliant. Joe, remember when you ran against her in the English schools back then?
more of an event for specialists. And the only exception to that rule in this leading group today is Elliot Kepchogi. I'd love to see him run well. He's a great man. He's a great athlete, too. Well, the shard towering over the southern bank of the River Thames. The embankment has been jammed with runners all week. Some uh, wanting to sample the atmosphere of Marathon Week. And a lot of them who will have been jogging around, yes, will be running, but lots of others who've come to London just to watch. This is one of the favourite places. Tower Bridge, they come early, get their place, and then create a wonderful atmosphere as the athletes climb the bridge. It's a little bit more of a hill than you might think, to be fair, but uh, for the elite athletes, it's not too bad. And then they crest the hill with the shard on their left, and then they'll take a right turn when they go past actually the hotel, the event hotel is just on their right hand side as they come onto the north bank of the river. And in days gone by, one or two were tempted to call it a day at this point, but not today. Look at that group there, the best marathon runners in the world here in London, locked together in battle at a fast pace, course record pace. Well, they were running past the course record so far at this point. As our resident weather forecaster, Steve Cram, predicted, the weather's improving, the roads are drying out, the sun's shining. I don't know why the Met Office don't listen to you, Steve. You, you predicted it all earlier. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, well, it, you know, the, the good thing, though, is that, you know, given that... It, it's interesting, the contrast that we were talking right at the very beginning, Bren, about... And, and, Joe, I'll bring you in on this as well, about the idea that you know, too many good men, we might not get a fast race. The women might really go for it, nothing to, not so much to lose. And we've, we've actually got the opposite happening here. Yeah. I mean, Amanda, it's very impressive to watch. Like, you know, they all look like they're handling this relentless pace. And it's just amazing. And, you know, the people can't really comprehend how fast they're actually running. And it's good to see the men out there really going for it. It's, it's always a difficult one when you put so many great athletes together. Will they go for it or will they start playing cat and mouse and watching each other? And it's, like you say, very interesting to see the contrast between the two races at this stage. Ten athletes in this leading group as they come towards the halfway point. There's going to be some big changes here. All ten of these athletes can't run course record times today. Jeffrey Mutai, the first one, coming under pressure. Stanley B. Watt at the back of the group. The world record holder joins him at the back of the group. Wilson Kipsang just a little bit ahead of them. And the man that's never been more than inches behind the leaders, Elliot Kipchoge in the pale blue vest. Just watching every move, getting himself positioned for the drinks. That's an important point of the race. That's where the athletes do show a little bit of friendliness, a bit of favour to one another. It's important that you put your drink out, you get it in the lead group particularly. And at this point of the race, it's particularly important that the athletes take on the hydration or the glucose that they've, that they've planned beforehand. And you can see them drinking as they run. They perfect that technique. And there, Wilson Kipsang hands the drink to McConnell and says, there you are, there's a bit left, you can have that too. Won't do you any harm. Jeffrey Mutai not able to list the last for them. There he is, just drifting off that group. Yeah, Jeffrey was the one uh, that uh, we thought might struggle today, but was quick, not in uh, as good a shape. He's had a bit of an injury problem. He had to pull out of the Tokyo Marathon, which he was going to run in February, which London then thought was a good thing because he reassessed his target to come here to London. But it's obviously he's missed a little, a, bit, a little too much training, really. But oddly enough, he's, he's important in the story of this race because it was Jeffrey Mutai who persuaded Dennis Cometo to start training seriously. A friend of Dennis Cometo's saw him running around in the groups at home, told him, you know, if you really trained hard, you could get good at this. Cometo used to work on a farm, got into his running a lot later than many of the athletes, but it was Jeffrey Mutai who persuaded him and then has become a strong training partner of his. Will Kipsan joins the two occasionally for a few runs as well. But Jeffrey Mutai, who of course ran that super fast time in Boston, which uh, Boston isn't allowed for world record purposes, but uh, was kind of the world record at the time, if you like. But Mutai struggling today and allowing his friend, his very good friend, and his training partner, Kometa, who you can see on the left of the group there, still look good. The world record holder looking comfortable. There's such a lot of talent comes out of that part of Africa. There's such a lot of potential talent there too. And we look at that group now. I think 
Butai has gone out of the group, so it looks like nine athletes remaining with the two pacemakers. The world record holder is still there. The champion from last year is still there. The former world champion at 5,000 meters, right on the shoulders of the leaders. As I've said earlier, he's running this race like you run the track race. Don't get too far behind the leaders. His last track race was 12 minutes 55 for 5,000 meters. And if you look at the great distance runners, if you look at their range of marks from 1,500 meters up to 5,000, 10,000 in the marathon, there's probably only Kenanisa Bikili, the world record holder, and the great Haile Gebri Selassie, who've got a better set of marks for those distances from 1,500 meters up to a marathon than this man, Elliot Kipchoge. In the pale blue vest, on the inside, deep in concentration, the man who said, right, I couldn't make the Kenyan team for the Olympic Games, so I'm now going to, for the track, so I'm now going to have a go at the marathon. Four marathons gone, three victories, one runner-up behind Wilson Kipsang. He was ranked number one by Track and Field News, the World Magazine, as the top marathon runner in 2014. And I wonder, could, he, could this be his day today? Well, the women's race, also an intriguing one in a very different way, in the sense that none of the big names have decided to push this on. Felix has been the athlete who's been leading it uh, most of the way. She's now in second, as you can see there, but that group just starting to whittle down a little bit, but they're now running only just inside 225 pace, and uh, well, one or two having a brilliant day here. And El Mukim of Morocco wasn't expected to figure anywhere near the front of this, only has a personal best of 228, and look at this, she's leading now. Felix El Mukim would not have expected in in their dreams against this sort of field to be forcing the pace with uh, just five miles or so to go in the London Marathon. So Sigai on the far side, watch out for her real talent. Some go, uh, maybe not as good in the finishing stages. Florence Kiplagat having a little look right behind, wants to know where Mary Katani is. I'm sure she'll see her as the danger. Mergia won in a very fast finish in Dubai. Has she got, has she got what it could take at the end? Could it come to a sprint finish here? Now it's time to be brave, it's time to be clever as well though. It's time to ju judge an effort, not just make a wild effort. El Mukim watching, looking at her watch, clocking her own time. Florence Kiplagat on the outside, the former World Cross Country Champion. Right outside her, Tufa of Ethiopia. Sum Gong, and Felix on the inside now, Mary Katani in the white vest. And Priska Jeptu right at the back as Sonia Samuels, now on her own, running strongly still. Just, just has to keep this one going. She's now got little help from around. She's getting good support as she goes along the route, but as she gets closer to the finish, and people realize this is Britain, the number one British athlete today. Will she be running fast enough to put herself in the rankings for the World Championships in Beijing, or even more excitingly for her, the Olympic Games next year in, in Rio de Janeiro? Well, she's just going through a bit of a, a bad patch, I think, Brendan and Joey. She, she was for a long time 229, just slipped to around 230, 230 and a half. Not, nothing drastic. I think she's moving a little bit better than uh, when we saw just a few minutes ago. Yeah. So I think she's just got to work hard here. And if it was a little bit of a bad patch, you get them in the marathon, you, yeah, you, you have to sort of suck it up sometimes and hope it comes out. And I think she's moving better now. Yeah, she definitely looks like she's struggling a bit, but, but she definitely doesn't look like she's struggling more. If anything, she looks better now. And it's just hope she can keep focused. It is tough at this stage of the race, but whether she could take on a bit of sports drink or gel. I know when I was really struggling in my first marathon, just taking on board something, really felt like it gave me that energy boost and just focus on each stride and, and each mile and just will yourself that line. Come on, Sonia, you can do it. Well, she's well in the top 20, and as uh, one or two perhaps ahead of her to pick off as other athletes drop off. And now the pace is just being forced a little bit. Felix is just struggling a little bit perhaps, and now we'll find out who's feeling good today. El McKean, not the one we expected to be forcing the pace, but she is the one. It's uh, Tupac, 
never far away from the lead on the inside there. Siga, it's the Ethiopians who are kind of forcing things. But Florence Kipagat for the first time thinking, OK, not far now, less than five miles. Maybe I should start thinking about trying to break this group up. There's too many people there, Brent. Yep, two on the outside who had a marvellous year in 2013. She ran, she won the Great North Run and then she won the New York Marathon. And when I saw her that day in the Great North Run, the last mile she ran that day was faster than the men's last mile, so she can certainly finish. But on the inside, the other side of the road, in the white vest, Mary Katani, who we know she can finish strongly, but at the front now, the former World Cross Country champion, Florence Kiplegat, who really believes she's strong at the end. So now we're going to have a race. You wouldn't like to predict it at this point, but last year's champion isn't going to figure. She's out the back door. Mergia of Ethiopia has always looked strong and not made a move. So there are three Ethiopians in that group, four Kenyans in that leading group, and Ana Dulce Felix from Portugal, and then El Mukim just dropping off the back, the Moroccan athlete. Between these is clearly the winner, but look, there's nobody ready to go yet. Nobody's ready to make a long run for home. Coming up to two hours of running, the real tiredness is beginning to set in. And Anna Dulce Felix still hanging on. Florence Kipplegat looks very comfortable and she's really looking around at the other runners. And of course, she's the fastest ever half marathon runner. And um, she's one of the Kenyan quartet who hasn't won the London Marathon. And it's going to be a big title for her if she can achieve that goal. Well, I can tell you, uh, Paula Radcliffe is just slowing a little bit, which is good. And what about Chris Evans or back at Cuddy Start? He's gone through 10K in one hour and six minutes, and he is predicted a 4.40 finish time at that pace. He's looking very good, and I reckon if he runs four hours 40, you will not hear the last of it come Monday morning on his show on Radio 2. <laughs> Look forward to tuning in to hearing Chris tomorrow. He really is enjoying himself. Just yeah, over an hour for the first 10K. That's pretty good. I notice him looking at his watch, so he knows exactly what he's doing. He's a cleverer man than he appears, you know. He knows exactly what this is all about. He's been learning from the top stars. He's been asking them the questions. Some of them he's been asking them just to give, give him some words to say on the radio. Others have been for information and education. Can't blame him for that, can you? There he is. Yeah, I have to say, and uh, don't tell him I said this, but he did ask some of the best questions I think Paul and I have ever answered the other day. So um, he's, he's a student of it, of the race. Did you get them all right, Steve? No. <laughs> anyway, elite men really cracking along at course record pace. Elite women very, very different, a uh, lot slower, and uh, we could well be heading for a very, very tight finish in the women's race. But the men, things are just starting to break up a little bit here. That group is uh, just getting smaller one by one. Uh, Kip Tsang, I can still see there. There's Kimeto, Kip Chogi, the big names. All just in there. Kitwara, watch out for him as well. He uh, ran very well in Chicago last year. Regassa there. Stanley B. Watt, who really misjudged the race two years ago, said he learned from that last year and came second in the London Marathon in 2014 behind Kip Sang. Well, the relentless pace will certainly take its toll in the later stages. In the men's race, there were 10, then there were nine. Now there are eight in that leading group, still following those pacemakers. The last mile of four minutes and 50 seconds, and that's a good time at that particular point. But it's a war of attrition in the men's race. There'll be seven soon, and then six. And we'll just see how this works through the... There's the men coming out from underneath. Let's just see if there's anything changed. There's the group. Now there are eight. Elliot Kipchoge picture of concentration the world record holder getting serious now this is time to get serious Emmanuel Mutai just holding on hanging on to the back in the white vest Kip Sang looks as though he's directing operations the former world record holder the reigning champion the man that the rest of the Kenyan athletes look up to when it comes to marathon running he was inspired by the great Paul Turgat and he said I want to run like him well He's done that. He's broken the world record like Paul Turgat has. And it's such an inspiration to watch generation after generation of these athletes. And this man, I'm really hoping that Elliot Kipchoge can run well today. He's got the world record holder on the one side. He's got the former world record holder just behind him. 
He's in the elite. He's only been beaten in the marathon. And it took a world record to beat him. Well, it's not going to be a world record today, but it could be a course record today. And I wonder, can Elliot hang on as Kipchoge? Kimeto moving alongside him for the first time, just showing his presence, just letting him know, I'm the world record holder, I'm here, they're not away from me. And as soon as he does that, Wilson Kipsang, the champion, responds. So he wants to be just glancing across, just seeing the world record holder in action. Now the two of them together. This is the first time they've met at the marathon. Kipsang and Kimeto occasionally train together. Biwat on the outside, Emmanuel Mutai just hanging on the back. Yeah, I think these next uh, couple of miles in particular, look at Manuel Mutar struggling. Kipchoge just getting his ring, looks good to me, looks comfortable. We've got Ragasa in there as well, one or two less known, or they're very, very good athletes. You know, we've, we've got sort of seven, eight men who've run under 2.5. You know, there's got to be some quality coming through there, but Mekinen looks like he's working hard. Kipsang looking comfortable, but these next two, three miles, I think are going to be crucial, Joe. His pace is still good. It has been slowing slightly, but I think it could pick up again. They're just outside course record pace, and look at Kipsang. This yeah. could be it here. He's sending a message to the other runners there, isn't he? Showing them how he's feeling, and he, he looks good, and, you know, that might worry them a bit, the way he was able to surge so easily like that off an already fast pace. The world record holder not responding yet as Kipsang just drifts to the front effortlessly. Kipchoge, for the first time, got a few athletes ahead of him, and now the world record holder moves through alongside his training partner. And now you see them together. These two athletes, the fastest run of all time. Dennis Kimeto, the third fastest of all time, Wilson Kipsang and the sixth fastest of all time there, Elliot Kipchoge. So you can't say there's no talent here. There's an enormous amount of talent, and it's all gathering at the front. Three of the fastest six marathon runners of all time are in the first three. So that race really is hotting up in all senses. Look at Kipchoge just uh, looking for some elbow room and talking about elbow room, you need some on Tower Bridge. It's busy somewhere in there. Paula Radcliffe, I don't know if Denise can find her. How you doing, Paula? Look. How you feeling at this point, Paula? Your Achilles went at seven. It's mad. It's mad. Are you sure? <laughs> well, Denise was told that Paula wouldn't stop. Uh, but I can say that Paula has slowed down, thankfully, from the very fast pace she was running earlier on. She ran a couple of 5Ks in 17 odd, then her third one was at 19 minute pace. And uh, I don't know if she had a bit of a problem there, but she's sort of settled in now. And uh, she's still running about 2.35 pace. And both of your comments. And the, the interesting yeah. thing there with Paula was you knew she wasn't going to stop. So Denise yeah. does that in-depth interview and there were more questions than answers as Paula whipped by, and now the crowd knows she's coming, she's getting fantastic support, she's sensibly set, settled down, probably a little tired already, but that's a great a great piece of action from Paula Radcliffe, and there was no way she was going to stop no. the interview. I mean, she's still smiling and felt sorry for Denise there, she probably had all these brilliant questions to ask Paula, and there's no way you can keep up with the pace that Paula's running, even when she's... Um, not her total best, but still great to see Paula out there just still enjoying it. And she said it's mad, I heard her say it. You know, the crowd are just really up to seeing her. It's brilliant. Do you know, last night when she was eating a, a meal, it was the first time I heard her say she felt a bit overwhelmed. I think she'd been taking it all in her stride all week, and then the last couple of days, it really started to hit her. And uh, she'll be, I hope, enjoying every moment out there. Now in the women's race, so we'll just break off for a second. Yes, thanks, Steve. Huge drama still to come in the elite men's and women's races. And we're saluting another wonderful champion here. This is one of the visually impaired marathon runners, El Amin Shentu, making it a hat-trick of victories here in London. An absolutely brilliant performance. He smashed the world record. 
He is in a class of his own, took the gold at the Paralympics over 5,000 metres, but he looks so, so comfortable on the roads now, over 26.2. That was a truly outstanding performance. He is shattered, but he has richly deserved yet another world title and yet another win here in the London Marathon. Proudly flying the flag for Morocco. He wants to win three golds next year in Rio, the 15, the 5 and the Marathon. That would be quite some tally. 2.21. A new world record. So, a few moments ago, we actually had confirmation that it was Raymond Martin, the youngster in the men's T51, T52 category. Raymond Martin was the man who came home with the victory. Sands was in second rather than the winner. Another great win for the Americans. Well, the elite women are now well on their way towards the finish and it's all changed. All sorts has happened in the last five minutes in the women's race. We had the three Ethiopians trying to break away. Mergia has now gone back into the pack, but it's Tupa and Sigai who are now pushing on. Sigai, who won in Berlin, set a new personal best there last year, has also won Tokyo, knows how to win the big city marathons. Sigai is from the same town in Ethiopia, Pekoji, as Kenanisa Bekele, Tiranesh de Baba, got great pedigree. We thought it would be the Kenyans, but it's Ethiopia on top. Yeah, I mean, the break has now happened and it, all the talk was about the fantastic four, the Kenyan quartet, but now you see the Ethiopians making a break for it and it looked like it was going to be Merger that was going to be the Ethiopian that was going to feature, but now you see Tufa and Segai making a break for it. Neither of these athletes have ever won the London Marathon and, you know, they'd be t very determined to get their first title here today. Well, the second Ethiopian athlete there, Segai, she won the Berlin Marathon last year. Tufa set the pace and set a fantastic pace in the Dubai Marathon earlier this year. He wasn't able to finish, but now he's rebounding. The steady pace over the first half makes this a completely different kind of event altogether. It means you're going to get a different caliber of winner when they run slowly. But Tufa and Sege, one and two, and still the chase is on, though, behind them. They're in the tunnel alongside the embankment. <clears throat> and while we watch the women, there's the leading group in the men's race. The world record holder leads. Elliot Kipchoge, second behind him. Just behind him, Wilson Kipsang. Now the group is down to six. And they've just lost uh, the final pacemaker, who I just saw step off uh, a minute or two ago. So it's now up to them. It's up to these big names. Regatta is in there as well, running a race of his life at the moment. Kitwara, uh, is definitely capable of running with these guys. Said he finished second to Kipchoge in, in Chicago last year. Stanley Biwot running another big race. Kipsang, Kimeto, the two biggest names, the ones that we said would be the head-to-head. -head. This uh, a race which was billed as these two big names, but always was going to include other quality. And look at Kipchoge. For me, Joey's looked the most comfortable, probably along with Kipsang. But to be fair, this is the first time we've seen Kimeto get near the front. Yeah, I mean, I've been watching Kipchoge. He's got such a compact, economical style and he's just so rhythmic and just working away and looks great. And all these men have just got brilliant running styles. The event has moved on so much. I remember watching the event a few years back and you'd see people with not such fantastic styles, whereas now, you know, they're all just, you know, an example of just running perfection, really, the way they've just taken it to this different level. Well, while I hope that group are hanging together, all sorts of changes in the women's race. Tufa is trying to push away, and of course her teammate Sigai tried to go with her, but Sigai now being reeled in by Mary Katani, Florence Kiplagat. But what can they do about the leader? She's now got, you can see there, about a 25-meter lead, and there is still plenty of time for that to change. Katani can close quick, quick. Florence Kiplagat can close quick. Tupa has shown that she's misjudged pace in the past. So there's Kiplagat, Katani in the white at the front of that group with the other two Ethiopians. Can they catch Tupa? Now the chase is on. And if you remember, <coughs> Tufa stretching out there. But in the last race she ran in Dubai, she was well clear of the halfway point. 
she was on two hours 18 minute pace and then she she dropped out she finished she couldn't finish and now mary katani probably the favorite before this race started passing sigai passing mergia the two ethiopians so the leader is tufa of ethiopia trying to win this big race for the first time and we just look down the road you'll see the gap is closing slightly now the race is on can she catch her can she bring herself away from that pack of three and tufa running still running well she certainly looks strong at the moment um like you say in the past she's got a pace a bit wrong obviously dropped out of dubai didn't get things right there she's probably you know learned a lot from that experience but whether they'll close the gap the quality of the athletes behind her and obviously the pace hasn't been fast the whole way through so they're all going to have a bit left in the tank so she's in a danger zone there but does look strong at the moment around six seconds the lead but that can disappear in in a few hundred meters if you don't get it right she does look strong as joe said but one or two of the uh, ipc athletes to aim at as she's coming in here but still plenty of running left to do and given the nature of this race it's a very different feel that uh, you have you're always tired at the end of any marathon doesn't matter what pace it's been but yeah. this surge of pace that she's put in here you have to judge that right because if you go with it just too hard then you can still really drop off in the last mile or so but so oh, far definitely. so good but she keeps looking behind yeah she's looking behind but to be fair the faces of the athletes second and third and katani and say guy their faces look quite strange as well definitely mary katani but they're working away they're trying to get back to her but they certainly don't look extremely comfortable you can see them there the faces don't look totally relaxed but um they're pushing to try and get back to her mary mary katani under pressure there you can tell by that expression Tufa running a bit more freely, and Katani just trying to stretch there. A glance over the shoulder from Sigai. Does that mean she's going to let Katani pull away from her? The crowds along the embankment are getting a rare race here. They're giving them good support, and there's a good, strong battle on here for second place. Now, can those two, working together, going faster, accelerating together, can they close that gap? Tufa leading there by just about six or seven seconds. It's not enough of a lead yet to call it a winning lead, but it could suddenly turn into that if she just keeps going when she gets along the embankment and starts to turn as she comes towards Big Ben and Parliament Square. So now we've got a real race on. It's accelerating in the second part. The first part was slow, and then it even slowed down a little. Now they're picking up the pace, and there's a different result than what we expected by every stretch of the imagination. Four big guns from Kenya came here to try and win this race. Is any one of them going to win, win it? At the moment, the needle starting to swing towards the athlete from Ethiopia who does a long, protracted look over her shoulder, checks her watch. The pressure's on her. Can she keep going? Well, she has extended it by another second or two while we've been talking over the last two minutes. And she's running strong through 40 kilometers. Not far to go now. She's not as familiar with the, the finish here, of course, as Mary Katani, but when you're running as strongly as she does, that's 11 seconds. So it has jumped out another three or four seconds. And Katani not able to really start to change the momentum here. The momentum's all with Tupa. And look at this Sigai now deciding, well, if you're not going to, I might have a bit of a go here. Yeah, I mean, out of the three of them, Tufa does look the most comfortable. Um, she keeps looking back, but she looks confident and strong. And definitely Sagai actually is looking over her shoulder as though she has thoughts of whether she can also maintain that third. She's definitely looking back. But um, Tufa looks strong at the moment, and they're certainly not closing that gap at this late stage of the race. Stretching away now. Crowd and encouraging biggest Tufa of Ethiopia. We've seen plenty of Ethiopian athletes run well here, but it's a while since we've had a winner from Ethiopia. And I think the last winner from Ethiopia might well have been the great Dorado Tulu, if I'm not wrong. Back in 2001, Dorado Tulu, the Olympic 10,000 meter champion from Ethiopia, was able to win this. The athletes will soon be in the shadow of Big Ben and the crowds on the embankment as the weather dries up a little, even a hint of sunshine here. And they're seeing another athlete from East Africa. That's pretty predictable. 
but it wasn't predictable today which athlete from East Africa would be? I mean, obviously, what? Tufa's got a good history in that in 2014, she did win the Shanghai Marathon in a course record. So she's someone who's really coming to the fore in marathon running, but she just looks strong. I mean, she's not fading at all. She looks really, really strong at this point. Well, she threw in a five minute, five mile, and that's what did the damage. There haven't been many miles run by women on this route quicker than that. I remember Paula one year, I think, running a 4.59 in there somewhere, but there won't have been too many miles covered quicker than five minutes, five by any athletes. And that's what's created the gap. The question is, can she hold it? She is holding it. Katani has rallied again and is now trying to move away from Sigai, but the rhythm's not there. And it's Tupa who's carrying all before her at the moment, will be feeding off the crowd, takes the turn. Big Ben now behind her, now her focus will be on to Birdcage Walk and there's huge crowds there, the atmosphere here will really help her. She knows the finish isn't too far away and if she hasn't misjudged this, and I don't think she has because she's running way too strong, then it won't be long before she'll be able to sense victory. Yeah, definitely, the crowds are going to really lift her now, she's getting to that finish line, she seems to be comfortable in her position, the, the two next athletes don't seem to be challenging her and, and Katani started to pull away from Seigai for looking like she's probably going to get in second place. Mary Katani in second place just pulling away from Seigai and I remember the Olympic Games here in 2012, we came to this point, there were four athletes in the leading group, Mary Katani was one of them. She was the favourite, having won the London Marathon earlier that year in 2012. But along this part of the course, she suddenly faded and lost 39 seconds to finish agonisingly out of the medals in fourth place in the Olympic Games when it was held here in 2012. Today, she was a favourite. She was expected to win this race by many people, but she's found an athlete, Tigis Tuffa of Ethiopia, who's too strong for her today. Now, she's just got to concentrate as she goes along Birdcage Walk, receiving warm applause from the crowd. They won't know too much about her, but they certainly will after the race is finished. And she's stretching, still running strongly. The victory is within her grasp now. She just has to keep concentrating, keep doing it. And as I look down the road, you can see that gap. It's not enormous, but it's a good gap. She's looking over her shoulder. No information for her there. She can't see how far they are behind. And there goes Mary Katani pulling away from Sigai. But I think there's still going to be a race for second place here. Yeah, they certainly still like they're battling. Um, Sigai came back at her for a moment and she's, she's not giving up that fight. Um, they're both fighting to the line there. The gap has not got any bigger, but it's not shortening either. They're still about 10, 11 seconds behind the leader and they're running out of time here. They're running out of distance. They've had 26 miles to try and do something about this, but Tupa is the one who grabbed the race by the scruff of the neck after a lot of really cat and mouse sort of tactics and one Oh, another look behind from her just to check on what's going on behind, but she's running strong enough for me, Joe Brendan, uh, before she gets into the finish here. Really just a, a quick word on how to, this year's race has gone. <laughs> well, there's an interesting battle for second and third, but the Kenyan favourites are certainly not going to be on the top of the rostrum. May not even be in second place on the rostrum, but the, the battle for second and third is still to be, to be worked out. Mary Katani on the inside, Number 102, really working hard for it. But at the top of the birdcage walk and turning into the mile soon, there is the diminutive figure of Tigis Tufa coming round this corner, the first Ethiopian to win the London Marathon since the great Dorado Tulu. And she'll know all about Dorado Tulu. She inspired them as they've got 385 yards to go. Yeah, I mean, Dorata Tulu has been a great inspiration for all these Ethiopian athletes and Tufa really did take the race by the scruff and the neck in the end. It was a really interesting race, um, cat and mouse and wondered who was going to make a go for it. And it's been really exciting. The tussle for second and third is obviously very exciting as well. But here she goes, so it's fantastic, even gives the waves to the crowd. Brilliant run. A brilliantly judged race from Tufa of Ethiopia. Waited and waited and waited, and then when she hit the front, she hit it hard, 
and put in a really fast mile and all of the big names all of the build-up all of the talk about kenya was swept away in her way nothing they could do about it she has another couple of looks behind but now she can enjoy the last 150 meters waving to the crowd super of ethiopia heading for victory in the london marathon this will be the biggest win of her career to date it's been a great tactical performance from Tupa of Ethiopia. She is the London Marathon champion in 2015. The battle behind her for second and third, the former champion Mary Katani was going for another victory this year, not to be, this is her first loss since she's come back from the birth of a second child. Mary Katani has to settle for second. Sigai, a strong third for Ethiopia. The two nations always seem to do battle on the world stage, be it cross country, be it track, or be it road in distances. This year, here in London, it's been Ethiopia who've come out on top. Mary Kitani has to settle for second place. What a finish from Tufa. 5.05 for the 24th mile, 5.07 for the 25th mile, 5.14 when she had the race won. That's where the damage was done. Those two really hard, tough miles. Mergia crossing the line in fourth place. Good run from her as well. Really has been Ethiopia's day as Sumgong crosses the line in fifth. And Priska Jetu just coming into the home straight in front of us here. Not the race we expected, Joe. No, but very much an exciting race when it came to the closing stages, um, especially second and third. But yeah, Tupa ran awesomely out there today. She really had control of the race, really. And you went to make a move and timed it brilliantly. Well, here's Priska Jetu, the winner in 2013. Was injured uh, here last year, actually. Took a long time to get over that injury. And uh, was due to run in New York in the autumn, but then had to wait for a chance to run here in London. Hasn't gone well for her here today. Felix behind her, really good run from the Portuguese athlete. There she is, and Felix will have a personal best there. Oh. A best coming into this was 225.40, and that a really good performance from the Portuguese athlete, of course, her own country, have had so many great champions in the past. And now they will start to come in. One or two national records were perhaps up for grabs today. And uh, we'll be able to tidy all of that up in their due course. Azuronak of Belarus, good race from her. At least a minute and a half inside her personal best. And of course, the next athlete we'll probably be keeping an eye out for will be Sonia Samuels, who the last we saw was still heading for low 230s. Tufa, the winner in 2015. So let's look for Sonia Samuels, Bren. Well, it's going to be a tough run in from here. It's Sonia has uh, stuck to a task well. And that, uh, I guess uh, she won't quite know really whether her performance today is going to be good enough because uh, it'll be later in the year when the marathon selection policy is announced by UK Athletics. It's been tough out there. Well, a good performance by Sonia Samuels as she comes in the shadow of Big Ben. And hopefully the announcers are getting the message to the crowd that he is Britain's first finisher in the women's race. An athlete who's got a chance of selection now for the World Championships in Beijing. And hopefully the time will give her a chance to get close to a spot for the Olympic Games. But the selectors will tell us later. In the moment, well done to Sonia Samuels. The elite women at the finish, an Ethiopian victory. And we go back to the men's race, still the six in the leading group. The odds are five to one against Ethiopia this time. Five top Kenyans and Regassa of Ethiopia. Won the Rotterdam Marathon before, won the Great Ethiopian Run a couple of years ago. That was his springboard. And now he's got the world record next record holder next to him. He's got the world, the, the champion just behind him. He's got Kipchoge now, the famous track runner and world champion on the track next to him so he's going to be feeling a little bit outnumbered these men are running on course record pace there are six of them 
and the only way you're going to win this one is by accelerating from here. So I feel as though the course record is under certain pressure. It's under pressure, Brent, but they have slipped a little bit, but they're still within that zone. They're right around the 2-5 mark, and uh, with the course record being about 30 seconds or so quicker than that, then 2, two hours 4.29. It's still within range. Remember what we've just seen in the women's race. Big surge in the last two or three miles. Who in this group is capable of doing that? Certainly Kipsan could. Could Kipchoge. He obviously feels as though he needs to put Kimeto, Biwat, who's running another great race, Kichwara, Kipsang, Regassa. He feels as though he needs to put them under a bit of pressure. The pace has been up and down very fast early on, settled down, dropped off a little bit, but it's been pretty steady all the way through. I think we're certainly heading for something under 2.5 here, and it could yet be a course record, as you say. Look at the action from side on of Elliot Kipchoge, the track runner whose time at 1,500 metres, 3 minutes, 33 seconds. So he's got the economics of action, which allow him to go quick, and look how fast he's moving. Look how comfortable he looks. He said, Brendan, um, chatting the other day, that he felt as though the transition to the marathon he'd really enjoyed, and actually, he now says, I prefer marathon running to track, which took us all back a little bit, because he was a great track runner, a lovely track runner, as you said. But he says, I prefer this now. I've found as though I've found out what I'm really good at. Well, when you look at his CV, you'll see two of the great 5,000-meter races of all time, the World Championships in Paris in 2003, where he beat the great Kennedy Zabakili and El Garouge, and then 2004 in the Olympic Games. He also was competing with those two, and they just outgunned him that day. But he's been amongst the best. There he is, one hour, 28 minutes, 56 seconds. Course record is under threat at 30 kilometers. But the, the position, the talent, the competition, the race is still to be unfolded. That's a time, this is a race, and that's the difference. And I think the fact that they are all still there is why that time is under threat, because somebody is going to break out of this group. We're talking about time. Sonia Samuels, the last we saw her, had slowed a little. We're still heading for around 2.31, 2.32. She hasn't got far to go now. And Sonia will certainly be the best of the British athletes today, including Paula Radcliffe. But it's been a, a tough second half of the race. And this is the thing for me, Joe, about for the women is that, you know, the, the elite women, the British women, there's nothing for them to race really out there. And it does become a bit of a time trial in the second half. Because she stuck to her task well, but I think she might be a little disappointed with her finishing time here. You can never be too disappointed with a 231, 232 marathon, but it's been hard. Yeah, I mean, she did have to do a lot of that race on her own, and she did really well to just be so gutsy and just keep pushing that pace and it won't be a PB but it will be a very good time for Sonia and she'll definitely have put her marker down there for the selectors to really be able to consider there so she's done a good job here today and well done Sonia so the cheers ring out a recognition that this is Britain's number one in 2015 Sonia Samuels there will be others who uh, will be attacking fast marathons later in the year I'm pretty sure aiming towards if not Beijing, certainly towards Rio next year in 2016. Sonia herself will have her sights on that as well. It could be that she may end up in Beijing running the 10,000 metres, we don't know yet. But today, it's been a good, strong performance in the London Marathon. Did attack it early on, certainly went out with real intent to run under 2.30. Hasn't quite been a day in that respect, but it's been a good, solid run from Sonia Samuels. 2.31.45 and crosses the line after having had a really tough last uh, seven or eight miles pretty much on her own but she stuck to it really well well done to sonia samuels being ushered through the finish photograph will be appearing in athletics magazines next week big crowds here at the finish today enjoying the wonderful atmosphere it's always a great achievement to be the first British athlete as well. She should be very proud of herself there today. Well done, Sonia. Well, if you forgot your watch, most people seem to watch with uh, watches, well, run with watches all the time. And uh, Big Ben always there to remind you exactly what time it is. 
of course for many of the athletes they they all wear a chip and if it takes 10 minutes to cross the start line but of course it's not their uh, time when they cross the line they'll know they'll get their individual time everybody will get their own individual time that it takes them to cover the exact marathon distance from the timing mats at the start to the finish line and of course uh, so many stories which uh, we'll be following in the next two and a half hours or so the uh, elite men will finish and uh, then we'll uh, change our focus if you like but still lots of running for so many people to do and although the elite men are getting to the point where they're thinking about the finish for so many they still uh, have probably got fond memories at the start well the atmosphere is overcoming them it's really getting exciting in the men's race as the crowds are supporting the athletes coming over time tower bridge wonderful scenes wonderful atmosphere great crowds great endeavor here wonderful color millions of pounds being raised for charity and when we watch alongside now let's see if we can find the leading man you can see the cars coming in there as the runners go and applaud the lead athletes going the other way there is the leading group and right in the front the world record holder Dennis Kometo alongside him a former world champion on the track Elliot Kipchoge behind him in the white vest Wilson Kipsang and now they're down to five four Kenyans and Regassa of Ethiopia now the odds against the double victory of four to one Ethiopian Tufa won the women's race and now the world record holder for the first time strikes the front Kipchoge glances at him he's holding his drink affectionately he knows he's going to get a little bit of a boost from that in the later stages Wilson Kipsang last year's champion just in fifth place there trying to get past B what his teammate and Regas has done really well to live with these guys the big guns three of the fastest six marathon runners of all time in that leading group Elliot Kipchoge has been keen to be the leader Kibeto's only recently showed he's got some affection for the front and Wilson Kipsang if anything if you're going on how they're looking and how they're behaving he's almost controlling this group four of his teammates against Regassa meanwhile back at the finish Emma step two from the Cornwall club turned 45 just about three weeks ago what a great run and uh, well, Emma, you, Joe, showing people that uh, you can still run really, really well into your 40s. Another good run from her. Yeah, great run from Emma Stepto. Um, brilliant athlete. It was great hearing her words before the race, how she was just going to go out there and just be so inspired to be on that elite start. And she's done herself proud. What a fantastic run. Well done, Emma. Well, we'll get confirmation of her time, but it could well be that uh, the over 45 best of Joyce Smith has gone. It's very, very close to it. So we're going to wait for confirmation of that before I say it definite, but she may well have broken Joyce Smith's over 45 record, which would be a massive achievement. Right, so now, what's going to happen here? Ragasa, the one who's in there we wouldn't expect, but B1, second last year, Kipchoge, a man who wants desperately to win in London. He wants Chicago in fine style in the autumn. Kometo won in Berlin just before that in September last year, breaking the world record. Kipsan, the former world record holder. The winner here in London last year, of course. The man who was favorite to win the Olympic title in London and he overcooked it that day. He got it all wrong, went too hard too early. What's he going to do here? He should have been able to be described as the Olympic champion. He really was. He ran so quickly in the middle of the race, and then he, he caught him. He finished third, and he could have e well, no, he couldn't have easily won it, but I think he could have won it that day. A misjudgment by Kip Sang. Well, he hasn't made any misjudgments today. He's looking smooth now. For the first time, the acceleration you can see, Elliot Kipchoge coming under a little bit of pressure as the two marathon, the fastest marathon runner and the former world record holder, Kimeto and Kip Sang. Another acceleration from Kipchoge, and you'd look to see the split time here. It's going to be a fast mile, this one. Look how fast they're going to hang on. Look how hard they're working. For a moment, Dennis Kimeto, the world record holder, just backs off a little, just releases the tension. 
and Wilson Kipsang begins to stretch it. Is the world record holder coming under pressure as the current world record holder? Well, she's smiling. She's not under so much pressure. She's enjoying herself today. Yeah, she's still going well, and is still scheduled for about a 2.35 finish, although I think she is slowing a little bit, and uh, maybe those uh, weeks of uh, training that she missed with the Achilles problem during uh, sort of February, March, might begin to tell a little bit. But I tell you what won't change, Joe. She won't stop trying. <laughs> She'll keep running as hard as she can, Wait, even what, with a smile on her face. Yeah, what talent has Paula got that even being injured and running with a permanent smile, she can still be running on 2.35 pace. And it's just really unique watching Paula run with a smile. She's such a gutsy runner, and normally she's just putting absolutely every ounce into it. And um, it's just brilliant to see. And I'm just so pleased that she gets this opportunity to go out on her terms, you know, on her, a race which has done her so proud over the years. And it's just fantastic and i'm really enjoying watching her enjoy herself she's done so proud for this event too it was a fixture for a few years the world record holder for the women's marathon is enjoying the adulation of her loving crowd the men's world record holder has just rejoined that leading group dennis Kimetto in the gray blue vest in the middle wilson kipsang in the white on the outside kipchoge and a gap now to the Ethiopian, just drift. Regassa's just not able to live with it. He was working hard. Stanley B1 on the outside, who's second in last year's event. So now we have four almighty big guns. The world record holder, the three of the fastest six marathon runners of all time. As Regassa has run a great race so far, he's gonna be rewarded with a good time, but he's not gonna be rewarded with a podium finish today. As he looks down the road, he sees four formidable athletes ahead of him. Very, very good athletes in every sense. The training partners, Wilson Kipsang and Dennis Kimetto, Stanley Biwot, their teammate, and then the former world 5,000 meter champion. I'd love to see Elliot Kipchoge run on the podium today. I'd love to see him win it, actually, because it's a great, he's been a great athlete, been a great ambassador, been a great man for Kenya but he's got some problems today. Yeah, quickly, just to tidy up that uh, Emma step to, um, we were just getting us ahead of ourselves with uh, confusion on the clock, but yeah, she was two, three minutes outside of Joyce Smith's um, over 45 record, just to tidy that up. Now the men here, they slipped their time as well a little bit. They've uh, had a couple of slower miles. They've now almost a minute down on the uh, projected time for the finish. They could still pick this up a bit in terms of the course record. 2429. They're now operating more like 2525, 2530 pace. And you can tell that they're gathering themselves for something here to happen along the embankment. They've uh, been here before, not Kometo. He's paced this race before, but he hasn't been in these latter stages. He won't quite know what to expect. Kipsan does, B what certainly does. Kipchoge's still looking comfortable. I think they're slowing here, gathering a little bit, Joe, here waiting yeah. to see who's going to go first. Yeah, I mean, it's getting to that crucial stage of the race where they're all thinking about gathering themselves and who's going to make the move. And I think that's what's led to a bit of a slowdown in pace. But Regasso, who dropped off, he looked like he was showing the most strain for quite a while. But these four still look all in control of themselves at the moment. You can always tell, can't you, when they're across the road, you know, when they're, when they're not sort of tucked in a group and just not getting a nice ride along. Look at them, they're all four of them almost alongside each other. Only B what sort of hesitant. I think that's maybe because of what he tried to do in 2013 at about this point when he went too hard and Cabetta then ran him down. He was better last year, waited, but he's not really the big name here, is he? It's these three, they're the three big names. And what about one of them? Who's gonna push this on? Anyone can win it from here. You know, when these athletes know each other, they know who who's the fast finishers, they'll know who's strong. But when it's in, under pressure in a big race like this and they've run hard most of the way, they're, well, they're going to be close to the course record, so no one's run any faster than them here. And they're emerging from the tunnel, four of them lined up across the road. It's now who's going to make the move. It's thinking time. This is just relax for a little bit, keep the pace going, and who's going to make a move and how are they going to make a move. If you look at it, Elliot Kipchoge has been used to competitive finishes on the track. But can he be as competitive in a finish on the road? Kimeto, the world record holder, a different kind of race when he ran that today. Wilson Kipsang's been involved in competitive races. He's won some of them, but he's lost some of them too. So you would wonder, you wouldn't bet yet. 
No, you wouldn't. But if you were to uh, put me up against the wall and pressure me, uh, yeah, if you're looking at this group, you'd probably say B1 wouldn't be able to handle the last mile or two the same as the other guys normally. And then the question is really Kachogi in marathons. Uh, he, he, of course, he's run very, very well. He's run very fast. And you, you kind of would assume, Joe, wouldn't you, with tracked pace that he has, yeah. that he would be the one. But I think, generally speaking, most people watching this, most marathon aficionados would think that Kipsang and Kometo will be stronger in the last mile. But yeah. it's great that the four of them are there, and it's great that we're thinking about it. Yeah, they certainly be worried about Kipchoge there in the closing stages, having such great track calibre. But yeah, it's hard to call. They, they all look like they've got a chance of winning at this stage. They all look in control of their running. But Joe, you know that the speed that you've got on the track isn't always there at the end of a marathon. No, I mean, that's what I often say about people training. There's no point having speed if you can't use it at the end. The endurance and the long reps, the hard workouts, your bread and butter, and having that bit of left at the end is definitely the battle when it comes to the marathon. It's now about who wants this one. Who wants this the most? As last year's champion, desperate to retain his title and become another athlete to win three times in London. Is the world record holder so proud of his world record position that, he, that he's not going to give it away. And is Elliot Kipchoge so convinced, as we watch on the right-hand side, there's Scott overall running well as he, as he runs the opposite way to the masses coming down. And the big cheer there. And the two of them now. Where's the world record holder? He looks as though he's dropped off. An acceleration from Wilson Kipsang has now left it down to two athletes. 24 miles. There is the world record holder with with his teammate and the two of them now suddenly as they went under the tunnel a breakaway occurred and now you've got the world champion the world record holder now in third place Stanley B. Watt in fourth place the world champion at 5,000 meters Elliot Kipchoge runs against the former world record holder for the marathon and, cu and current London marathon champion Wilson Kipsang the track runner against the marathon specialist. Who's going to prevail? This is going to be a fascinating race. Well, the signal, uh, as you uh, obviously worked out, breaks up when they're in the tunnel and we have to wait for them to emerge. And when they did emerge, as Brendan was saying, it was all change. And Kipchoge and Kipsang have now, well, now seems as though they've got the race between them. Kimeto and Biwat. A good 30 metres of drift, and these two looking good, looking comfortable. Lovely action from Kipchoge. Kipsang relaxed as ever, and will be thinking, this is my part of the race. When I'm going well and running well, this is what I do better than anybody else, closing in the marathon. World record holder, struggling a little bit. May still be on for third place here, but we'll have to hold up Stanley Biwat, who may well have run his race. There he is over on the far side, and uh, these two... Now watching as the their two countrymen disappear and look as though they're going to contest the win for themselves. B Watt just has a little look behind as he goes past the world record holder, but he doesn't go with him. And now Joe, this uh, is this going to be about track speed or the potential of track speed? Taking Brendan's point on about not being able to necessarily be able to use it, and against the wily Wilson Kipsang. Well, it's just so exciting, isn't it? And when we're talking about Kipchoge and his tracks, he doesn't look like any signs of not being able to deal with the pace that Kipsang's running alongside him. And, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. It doesn't look like he's tiring at this stage. I mean, there's not long to go now. But it's, a, it's such an exciting race, and it's amazing how those two athletes just pulled away from the others so quickly under that tunnel. The, the approach to the marathon is personified by those two men. There they are. Approaching 25 miles along the embankment. The crowds are out in force, and they'll see these two well known Kenyans battling it out head for head. Wilson Kipsang, the former world record holder, Elliot Kipchoge, the former world champion. They've been here before in 2013 in Berlin. The only marathon that Elliot Kipchoge lost, and that was to Wilson Kipsang. But Wilson Kipsang had to break the world record to beat him that day. The current world record holder, Den Dennis Kometo, is not able to compete with his two compatriots, Kipchoge and Kipsang. And who's going to prevail today? 
Well, the world record holder, he's going to have to settle for third or fourth, actually. But there, as the gold medal is down to these two, does Elliot Kipchoge have the speed on the road that we saw him use to such fantastic effect when he outsprinted the great El Garouge and the great Kenanisa Bakili at the 5,000 metres on the road? And now he's beginning to make a move. Wilson Kipsang, we've seen him finish strongly in the marathon. So now Elliot Kipchoge makes his move and strikes and tries to win this. I think Kipsang is staying on the inside. He's Don't looking look across the road, he's telling him the drinks are there. That last drink is really important in the last mile. The so there Kipchoge looks over his shoulder. Kipsang doesn't take a drink. Who's going to prevail here? What a battle we have on our hands. In New York, in November, Kipsang came into Central Park in the latter stages, side by side with Tessisa of Ethiopia. They even came to, almost came to blows in the sense that uh, there was a bit of pushing and shoving, but Kipsang's got real work on. Kimeto now has rallied, gone from fourth to third in the last 100 metres, and now moves past Biwat, but there's nothing he's going to do about these two in front here. Kipchoge doing what you're always told, use the water stations, these are great opportunities to try and get an advantage. Kipsang, though, right back on him. And there's only a meter between them. And as I said, going back to that race, and you were talking about Kipchoge being outkicked by Kipsang before. Kipsang knows how to close, and I think that's the worry for Kipchoge. That's why he's doing this. It's why he's not waiting. You'd think, wait, you've got the trap speed. But he knows. He's aware of what Kipsang is capable of, and I think that's why he's trying to force this on. I think he's right too, because we have seen Kipsan show the finish of a sprinter. He won the Great North Run a couple of years ago. He came, we thought the marathon runner didn't have the speed, but he certainly had the speed. And Kipchoge is trying to wear him down. But every time Kipsan moved, he moves effortlessly close to him. I think Kipchoge coming under a little bit of pressure, but I would love to see the track pedigree of Elliot Kipchoge prevail today. But the approach to the marathon, a specialist marathon runner, Wilson Kipsang, former world record holder, no real track pedigree. The more traditional approach, the track approach, be as good as you can be on the track, run as far as you can on the track, stay on the track as long as you can, and then move to the marathon. That's been the more traditional approach of the Europeans and of the Kenyans, and that was Kipchoge's approach. As Big Ben, you look at Big Ben, 10 past 12 on a regular Sunday morning, well, it isn't a regular Sunday morning, and these aren't two regular guys. Yeah, I mean, it's just so exciting and so interesting. Like you say, it looks like Kipchoge's the one pushing the pace. And Kipsang just looks so poised. And you just wonder who's got the answer to each one. Like, is um, Kipsang going to be the one that's quicker? Or is it going to be Chip Choge? It's just, you know, it's just so exciting. I remember 30 years ago, 1985, Steve Jones and Charlie Spedding had a great battle, didn't they? In the, I don't know, what was a pretty hot day, I seem to remember, and they... Steve Jones came out on top, they're both running 2-8. Well, the days of British athletes contending first and second, of course, have long gone. And that was a great race. We're seeing another one here today. But as is, has been the case for many, many years since then, it's about the Kenyan dominance and the Kenyan prominence in world marathon running. The fact that the world record holder can't even contend the win here. He has to settle the third because Stanley B. Watt has now given up third spot. He's pretty much jogging in. So third will be the best that he can do. I wonder if we'll ever see those days again, Steve. Because if you think about it, last year, Mo Farah tried to compete with these guys and he was found wanting. And he's the best track runner, five and 10,000 meter runner in the world. He wasn't able to live with these guys. There's a new pressure, a new stamina, a new kind of approach to the marathon. And these two guys personify it. The 5,000 meter world champion from Paris in 2003. Stepping up to the marathon, he's run five marathons, he's won three. Is this going to be his fourth? Or oh, Wilson Kipsang, last year's champion, knows his way along this ro road. It's going to be an almighty last mile. It's going to be what the London Marathon have asked for. This is what they hope for, two well-known distance runners giving it everything to try and become the 2015 London Marathon champion. In 1981, Dick Bardsley and Inga Simonson crossed the line together, holding hands, but I don't think we're going to see that this time. Kipchoge puts his foot down, opens up a gap for the first time. Clear daylight. We haven't seen that at all in this year's race. Five metres, and the gap, if it grows much bigger than that, will be a winning gap. Can Kipsang 
find anything to try and contend with the track specialist. Kipchoge keeps looking behind, hasn't got this one yet, but this is a brave effort with 650 metres to go. And did you notice there, Steve, when he put the pressure on, when he opened up those few yards, suddenly relaxation came over his face. He's almost smiling now. He feels as though with 600 metres to go, the world, the former world record holder for the marathon can't come back from this distance. Elliot Kipchoge has come through the traditional approach from the track. He's translating it to the roads. Five marathons run, three wins already. On his way to the fourth, if you judge by his face, that's the smile on his face, that gap is opening, he knows exactly what he's doing. I'm delighted because I think this is the route to marathon running. Elliot Kipchoge, a fine man, a fine ambassador, a wonderful runner. Yeah, he decided that was the moment he was going to make his move to try and win this race, and it looks like he's got this one. I don't think Wilson can, can probably come back to this now, but very well timed, brilliant run. He's looked composed throughout the whole race, and what a fantastic run he's done here today. In Berlin in 2013, Wilson Kipsang ran a brilliant race to win in a super fast time and beat Elliot Kipchoge, who on that day in second place ran his personal best. He went to Chicago last year and ran a super fast time in winning that one. But I think this will be the one which will be the biggest day of his marathon career because Elliot Kipchoge loves coming to run in places like London and he loves the big crowd. He's done it on the track in the past. He's had to work really hard for this, but on the day, all of the stars were here. The best in the world were here. The best in history were here. But in 2015, the London Marathon belongs to Elliot Kipchoge of Kenya. He is the champion. Wilson Kipsang takes second place. A great race from two great athletes. Uh, Kipchoge, that smile tells you all you need to know. The happiest man in London. Not far outside the course record in the end. And Kipchoge will not be bothered about that. I bet he wasn't even looking at the clock as he came up the finishing straight there. He was enjoying every single moment that he could and relishing in his victory. And Wilson Kipsan doesn't know how not to smile. He always smiles and he's a great champion and he's a great runner. But today he was second best. Well, I think that's fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted for Elliot Kipchoge as we watch the world record holder, Dennis Kimeto, come home in the marathon. Dennis Kimeto has found two athletes today who are better than the world record holder. They haven't taken his world record away. He'll be pleased about that, but they have taken his title away. They take the title of the best marathon runner in 2015 away from him. And I think Elliot Kipchoge will be absolutely thrilled. And if you think about him, there he is greeting, on his way to greet Kimeto, Elliot Kipchoge here, a gentleman in every sense, congratulates Dennis Kimeto, and 12 years ago, or 13 years ago, he ran and beat two world record holders on the track, the 1500 meter road world record holder, and the, five, and the 10,000 meter world record holder, to win the Paris World Championship. Today, he's beaten two world record holders. So the champion comes home, with a former world record holder behind him and the current world record holder behind him. So his CV and the video you put together for Elliot Kipchoge includes two fantastic races. World champion in Paris against two of the greats. World champion in London against two of the greats. Add in Olympic silver medal, Commonwealth silver medal, other world championship medals. But as I said, this might be the I think accomplishment that he may well be most proud of. If he doesn't get any better than this for Elliot Kipchoge, he'll be a happy man. Piwot has just crossed the line a very tired fourth. This is Rogasa in fifth place. And that was a brave effort from him to go with the fast pace. And just to reiterate the pace, they went so quick early on that they had to come back from that. But the 25th and 26th mile were the joint quickest of the race for Elliot Kipchoge, which just shows you what he managed to do. 4.33, 4.33, and uh, that's why he was able to come out on top. Kitwara, who finished second to uh, Kipchoge in uh, Chicago, 
Well, he'll not know the result at the front. Sixth place for him. We'll be keeping an eye out for Scott Overall, who was still on the on schedule for around 2 12 30 last time I looked. Well, Joe, that was a win for the track runners. Yeah, I mean, you could see how happy he was with that win. Um, so well timed. Um, like you say, he wasn't confident on leaving it right to the end, but he knew exactly when to make his move. He knew how he was feeling, and it was just superb and really great to see. Well, meanwhile, is this smile gone? I think, uh, I think, oh no, there, there it is, it's back again. Thank goodness for that. Uh, because. It'll be hurting Paula now because she hasn't prepared for this in the way she would have liked. So these are the hard miles. This is where it gets really tough. And she is slowing down a little bit, but she's still heading for a sub 240 clocking, well under 240 at the moment. But these cheers and the support will certainly help her, will certainly give her... Uh, that's Jenny Spinkers there actually just in front of her from uh, Bristol West 379. And... Uh, there's a championship race, a British championship race, so she's going well in that. But Paula will be finding this hard work now. She is slowing a little bit, Joe, in terms of her overall pace, but not too much. And let's hope that her body holds together for this last 30 minutes. There she goes, taking a drink on board. And uh, we'll just be hoping she can finish strong and still with that smile yeah, on her face. She's still enjoying it, still smiling. I was just wondering if it's harder to breathe if you smile the whole way, but because um, I think that must make it tougher. But I'm just so glad she's enjoying it. And the other runners will be enjoying the atmosphere for their run, the people running around her, definitely. There's, a, there's only a little distance between a smile and a grimace. Yeah, maybe she'll have the smiling world record for the marathon. <laughs> it's, it's turning into a little grimace. She looks as though she's working hard, but let's face it, everybody out there is working hard. And these athletes are enjoying the moment. Thanks, Paula, has been the message that's gone out this week. And Paula, and certainly, you know, these athletes, particularly the female athletes, who've been inspired by her performances over the time. This event has been enriched by Paula's presence in the past. And again today, she's run with the people, she's run with the masses, she's getting crowds waving to her from the other side as she's approaching. And they're approaching, they're going the other way. So Paula Radcliffe in the red vest with some useful company. But I did notice she had a bottle on the elite athlete table already designed, already there for her. But that was great, and it was great for her to take advantage of it. So we saw the world record holder, the men's world record holder, finish third in the men's race. And now we're seeing the women's world record holder. And let's be honest, that world record of two hours and 15 minutes will be a long time in the record books if we've got any judgment. She's now decided it's time to clap and cheer yeah. for them on the other side. A smile and a wave, and there's been, there's been plenty of them for Paula, and there'll be plenty more over the next 25 minutes, or maybe a little bit more, who knows. But uh, running well and enjoying every single moment. Here's the Commonwealth champion, Mike Shelley from Australia. Good, strong race from him. He was with Scott overall for a long way. I think Scott's dropped off it a little bit, but it's still running pretty well. 2.11 and bits for the Commonwealth champion. Well done to him. And we'll be keeping an eye open. We're expecting Scott to finish in the next minute or so. Shelley looks as though he's uh, well spent there. And why not? A good race from him, Joe. Yeah, definitely. He's given it his all. It was so great seeing him win that Commonwealth title. He thoroughly deserved that well-timed race. And you know, such an asset to his country, and it was brilliant. He gave it all there today, a solid run. Oh, it's a wonderful sight, isn't it, down there? Buckingham Palace is the place that you're looking for on a day like this. For Scott overall now, it's on his left, and Scott will be Britain's number one here. It's a good, strong run from Scott. He's had a couple of disappointments here in London, and uh, he was looking for a solid run here. He's been in good shape and good nick. And as he turns the corner, he'll be getting some big cheers from the crowd as they get told the significance of Scott overall. Had a great debut in the marathon, Scott, and there's yet to run quicker than that, but I still think he's capable of going quicker than 2.10.55, which he did in Berlin in 2011. 
It's going to be more like... I'm just looking up at the clock. It's going to be outside 2.12s. It's into the 2.13s. But, significantly, that may well be something which could qualify for Rio as long as away as that is next year in 2016. But Scott overall will know the significance of that. Staying strong here and a really good performance from him today. Has a little glance up at the top, you'll see. He's uh, outside 2.13, but not by much. 2.13-12, Scott overall, first British athlete across the line in 2015. Well done, Scott. First Brit and solid run by him. Something for the selectors now to consider. And Scott made such a brilliant debut at the marathon in Berlin, running 2:10:55. And you know he's shown he's got the ability to run those sort of times when he can get everything right. That's a solid run today. And you know, well done to him. Yeah, I know that if he recovers well, he'll be thinking about doing uh, perhaps uh, another race in the autumn and have a, uh, maybe a real crack at trying to run quicker. I think it was a good solid run from Scott today. Uh, of course, he'll... Uh, I guess it won't take long before he'll start analysing his performance and uh, plans about what to do next. But for the moment, I think he can be well satisfied with his performance. Yeah, I He's think... He's a tough taskmaster, Joe. He, he, might, yeah. he might feel... Uh, I know Scott, he'll probably be a little bit grumpy. Yeah, he's a gutsy runner and he gives it his all. And I think what was frustrating for him is he had such an amazing debut. And interestingly enough, he said he didn't even wear a watch on that day and he wasn't aware of what was going on. And it just went so right for him on that day. And now he's trying to move on from that. And he knows he's got the talent, he knows he's got the ability and he wants to get back to those times. Now we hear the crowds for Paula. You can just hear the noise, it's fantastic. Yeah, and... Um... I'm sorry to say for Jenny Spink there, but Paula's just gone past her, so Paula uh, certainly rallying well, staying strong. She just went through that previous five kilometres was at 18.59, which uh, she's still slowing slightly, but not by very much at all. As I said, I still expect her to run inside 2.40, uh, as long as everything's OK. There's still a long way to go, and this is the hard bit of anyone's marathon, particularly if you haven't done as much training as you would like, but this is Paula Radcliffe we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Paula had to miss six weeks of training at a crucial time, and um, it was disappointing for her because training had been going well. But Paula's just out there, um, you know, enjoying it, soaking up the atmosphere. And it is difficult for anybody when you haven't been able to even do the long runs in training. So much adaptation of the body happens when you do those long runs. And not being able to do that, it doesn't make it more difficult. But she's still going to run a decent time. You know, she's done some incredible things in her career. But, you know, sometimes the marathon, we forget. We talk about the world record, you know, but there was the year when she ran 218, I think, Brent. She finished in 67 something which at the time was just incredible because the world record for the half marathon wasn't that much quicker than that at that time and she ran the second half of the race that quick and, and yes she you know she she got better for 2003 but you know there is something she did which just rewrote how you should run the marathon for women they still haven't really caught up with it yet but she set a whole new set of parameters i think the interesting thing about paula is over the years she's She's avoided convention. She's been a pioneer. She's had people telling her what to do and what not to do. She's largely ignored that because if you are a pioneer, which she is, then you can't listen to the negative thoughts. You just need the positive thought. And she was breaking the rules in terms of, in terms of how quick she was running, how hard she was training, how often she was training. But she was showing the way for others to follow. And you know, my admiration for Paula is partly how she ignored what, what the convention of the time was saying and how she decided, I'm going to do it this way. And she said, if I can run that time, then I can run that for a marathon. And she was phenomenal en route. You know, she tried her level best to win titles on the track. And she came very, very close to winning gold medals on the track. Then she decided, I can't win them on the track now. I want to win them on the, ro on the, on the roads. And the marathon, she became the world, the world champion of the marathon. She was close to winning the Olympic Games, she was favourite for the Olympic Games, she had some upsets when that happened. But I think the thing is, you're writing one line about Paula, she was a pioneer of women's distance running, would be my, would be my line about her. Yeah, she's a, a pioneer for elite athletes and in a, a, a very different way. I think a huge inspiration for a generation of female runners of whatever age, kids and, and, and older women as well, just 
she made it acceptable to go out and get out on the streets and you know look a bit sweaty and work hard and just yeah. do it your way and I, th I think she probably you know we've talked to quite a lot about it this week she's had to contend with a lot of questions about that and I think for the first time in her career she's actually had to accept some of that talk because she's often just kind of pushed it away but it is true and you only yeah. have to have been walking around London this week with her yeah. to see the impact she has not only in our sport but beyond that as well yeah definitely I mean maybe Paula can finally realize how amazing people think she is um, she was so focused on just trying to get everything right and now you know the things that people have been saying to her she can really realize how phenomenal she actually is and I say it was a mixture of amazing talent but in that um, just amazing hard work ethic and just doing everything being so professional and just being so determined she's a real credit to the sport I think the interesting thing that you know today she was told by Gabby that in the first London Marathon there were 4% women and now there are 40% women and that's to be applauded and then Paula said yeah but next year there'll be 50% women so yeah. she's on, still on a, she's still on the mission, she's still on the cause, she's still encouraging people to run and women yeah. to run. She's got an interesting group around her who are enjoying the moment and the yeah. cheers that she's getting, sharing them around will help all these people, including Paul from Barnes Runners who's heading that group. But I think they've, they've all had a great day. And actually, to be honest, you know, this, these are good conditions for distance running. Nobody's ever run the distance better than Paula Rackett has. So here's the question. You're in the group, whether it's Paul or any other guys there, and you think, you oh, know, there's Rob. I'm on, I'm on personal best time. Yeah. If I just push on here, yeah. I might get my personal best. Oh, but hang on, I might, uh, but then I won't be running with Paula. Yeah, and also, <laughs> um, even though Paula's not at her best, I bet there's a few runners who would love to be able to say, oh, I beat Paula Radcliffe, even though that's a bit of an unfair statement when she's not at her best. They'll be excited to be able to tell their mates that. Well, I think there's two of them sitting right next to you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one thing on her behalf, which I think I should say, is that this won't be the last time you'll see Paula Radcliffe run. You know, this is the last time she said she will prepare for a race and announce it, etc. But she's been made, she's made the point on more than one occasion this week that, like the three of us sitting here, she's a runner. I'll include you, Brendan, in that. And you're always a runner. And you know, you can't help the fact that you will always be tempted to go and run 10Ks, half marathons and marathons around the world, around the UK. It's just that she wanted to prepare for this one as a real farewell and as an opportunity to thank the British support that she's had through her whole career as much as anything else. Have you run your last marathon yet, Steve? I might not have. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I may have. <laughs> I, I, you know, I get her point. I mean, I, you know, I, I bumped into Haile Gebri Selassie in uh, Singapore this year, you know, and he's loving being Haile and people around the world saying, hey, well done. And he's not running hard. He's turning up and, and enjoying being with the masses in some of the events. And I think I wouldn't be surprised to see Paula do a bit of that. But she'll do it on her terms when she feels like doing it, which is yeah. great. Today was not about that. Today was, yes, the last tilt at kind of getting into some sort of shape to run like Paula used to. Not as fast, yeah. not as good, not winning, but it's still Paula. Yeah. And as I said, Joe, she'll never get a day like this again. She'll never no. get this level of support again. And like we were discussing earlier, it was almost a blessing in disguise that she got injured a few weeks back, so at least she could return to some sort of training to be able to complete this race, because everyone was looking forward to the fact that Paula was going to be in this race, the public getting their opportunity to show their appreciation to her. And she's out there, she's running, and she's going out on her terms. So she didn't just end her career with not being able to take part in something. She's out there doing her proper retirement race that she really deserves. Fantastic to watch Paula in the closing stages. I think it's important to remember she was so good on so many surfaces as well. We're talking about a multiple world cross country champion, that brilliant win in 05 in Helsinki and that brave silver in Seville. So she hasn't just proved herself as a marathon runner. She was doing it on the country yeah. and on the track, albeit that she didn't get the global yeah. title over 10,000 metres. It's almost two decades of, of yeah. brilliance across three surfaces. Oh, yeah, she certainly proved herself on the track. I'll never forget watching her um, in Munich in the championships. It was raining like mad, and she nearly broke 30 minutes. I mean, it was just phenomenal. All on her own, just pushed the pace the whole way. And everyone was excited to see what Paula would do for a marathon, but I don't think anyone could comprehend 
the sort of world record time she would run. It's just unbelievable. And I can only comprehend it by breaking it up in small chunks, like what it is for half marathon, what it is for 10K. You think, how can she do that? It's just phenomenal. It, you know, it's unbelievable. It's just no one's going to get close to that for a while, I don't think. It's such an amazing world record. Well, we'll catch up with Paula shortly as we watch uh, back at Canary Wharf, the athletes going round and uh, not far away from there, I'm pretty sure Chris Evans, just to give you an update on him, I haven't seen him yet. Uh, and then these uh, around Canary Wharf, I can tell you, he's still going well. He's uh, almost at halfway, well, he will be at halfway now, he's still predicted for under five hours. So uh, Chris Evans still going well out there. Also mentioned to, uh, to one of my mates, Graham Loden, who uh, some uh, F1 fans might know as the Head of the uh, Mauritia F1 team, Graham's out there having not prepared quite as well as he might have liked, but so many people uh, with great preparation and one or two others uh, not so well. But Graham, I can tell you, is heading for right on the four-hour mark and uh, Brendan asking if I would uh, still run another marathon. It's not would you do one, it's how fast, how slow would you be prepared to run. <laughs> That's the key. The four hours. Uh, that's a pretty darn good time, and you've got to put a bit of work in to do that. There she is, emerged from the tunnel, still running strong. Now, I have noticed that uh, one or two of those guys we're talking about have either dropping off the pace here, or have decided personal best is uh, something that they're, going to, that they're going to chase. So uh, they're nicely spread out around Paula, giving the crowd plenty of chance to get a view. And she... It's working hard as ever. How familiar is that action? Years and years we've watched her. The bobbing head. Sticking to the task. You go all the way back. I know Brendan recently we program which people might have seen and you can go back to that World Cross Country junior title that she won in the snow in Boston. And you know, we knew she was a pretty good runner then, but I think that was the first time you kind of so the quintessential Paula Radcliffe, the one that we all came to know. And we've all been on a long journey with her. The ups and downs, the highs and the lows, the triumphs, and the days when it just didn't seem to go right for her. Well, but this had, is had. different. This is a different kind of day, and a one which uh, she can put in her memory cupboard to run alongside all those other great days. But she handled the ups and downs with style and with class. And she did have her share of them, including her preparation for this one. But marathon running, as David Henry told us earlier, is fraught with danger. David Henry trained for nine months to get ready for this one. And then just the other day, in his last couple of training sessions before running here, the former Olympic champion, 400 meter hurdles, at the age of 70, decided to run a marathon. And his legs gave way just a week ago, so he's out there on the course today walking around. And these athletes running around Paula are running at good times, you know. These are these are good athletes, good performances, good preparation, great day, great enjoyment. Yeah, it's like the athletes around her are able to capitalise on having such good crowd support. It must be willing um, a lot of them to good times, people running with her, because what an amazing atmosphere to run to for the athletes around Paula. And just hearing the name Paula continuously, it's such a... Um, amazing atmosphere well as they approach the finish area Andrew Smith is the finish director has implemented a lot of changes for the day new technical changes particularly with the IPC championship events it's done a brilliant job so far and it will be tested fully in the next half an hour an hour or so when the masses start finishing over the line but that's just Paula Radcliffe speak for I couldn't run quite as fast as I would have liked because she's put in another strong, strong performance here today to be able to say goodbye here in London in this type of race on a day like this. It's been her, about her today. We've had a couple of great races, but look, she is absolutely pushing as hard as she can here. Enjoying the crowds. Thank you, she's saying. And I think there's some emotion starting to come through here for Paula Radcliffe, and why not? I think that's right, Steve, but I mean, well done, Paula. I think everyone's been saying it this week, but thanks, Paula. Thanks for the inspiration. And you know what, Steve, I'd like to ask her when she finishes the calm down. We're going to do it again. She's been arguably Britain's best ever athlete. 
We have not really seen the likes of Paula Radcliffe in terms of, as Ron was making the point, cross-country track road racing. She's doing this because she was asked if she would finish in the middle of the mile. She's now not sure. She just wants to make sure she does the right thing here because the organizer said, please, can you move into the middle? And uh, as ever, Paula's thinking about where she should be in the race. But what a moment this is. Her whole career has been one which the British public has followed closely. They've run every step with her at times. They've thrilled and marveled at her performances when she's tried to drop the world's best when she was on the track and couldn't quite do it and somehow never quite managed to win. And then she moved up to the marathon where she found her event, where she found her inspiration and she found her true talent. And in 1981, they held hands to cross the line, the two winners, and Paula with Rob, who's run with her all of the way. She's met him on the, on the race today. She's met him on the course. She's made a friend, but she's got millions of friends around the world, and they all say, thank you, Paula Radcliffe. A proud moment. An emotional moment, I'm sure. Let's try to find someone to do that. Thank you. I was trying to get to the Mum and Dad, Sophie Rayworth, enjoying the moment. Friends and family, but everybody is in Paula's family today. On the road and at the side of the road. And watching around the world. We will never see her like again, I'm pretty sure. Certainly not here in Britain. Her records stand, the performances stand, and she stands proud as ever. <laughs> Selfie time. Oh, there. <laughs> Isla and Raph, Raphael. Ayla, Ayla, stop it! <laughs> Ayla, don't cry, I'm crying! Don't cry, well, Raphael wondered what's going on, and Ayla... Ayla, Ayla, Ayla... I think she asked her mum this week, she goes, so what does that mean? Does that mean you never run again? And Paul answered, no, let's probably still go for a run. <laughs> Gary, as ever, not far away. So come on guys, what do we think? She's, she had a little glance at the clock there at the finish. And who thinks here, sitting next to me, that there was a little bit of Paula Radcliffe went, ah, if only if. I wonder if I can still qualify for Beijing. Or, or I could have run a bit faster, but professional to the end. She clicked her own watch, she didn't touch, trust the timing thing. But let's be honest, she's having a great few moments here. These are the moments, this picture she wants to keep, be fantastic. And her mum and dad in the stand, well, Paula was inspired by coming to watch her father run all those years. She's going to be receiving the John Disney Award as well, the inaugural award, a little bit later on. So there, confirmation of the men's race for you. The Kenyan stranglehold on this race continues. And the women's race, it was... Uh, Build as a magnificent four to pick your winner from, but Tufa of Ethiopia spoiled the party for the Kenyans, who still have a strong, strong presence in that top ten, don't they? Mary Katani there, a winner here twice before, coming in second. And the men's wheelchair, just to confirm there, Josh George of the United States, ahead of David Weir, who just can't get that seventh win here so that he could eclipse Baroness Tani Gray Thompson's achievements. They're tied on sixth. Simon Lawson of Great Britain in 10th. And the women's wheelchair results for you, the top 10 there. Martina Snopek and Sarah Piercy of Great Britain coming in 9th and 10th. Tatiana McFadden topping the table four minutes quicker than her previous course record.
down the tee. 53-54, Josh George and David Weir and Simon Lawson in 10th. Sorry, ninth. And that's just confirming again, Tatiana McFadden is the winner in that incredible new course record. And the T45-46, fantastic win for Camuch there from Pires de Silva of Brazil. The T11, T12, Shintouf there confirming his time of 2.21.33. That would put him certainly a qualification for some uh, of the elite men's runners, incredible times they're posting.